All right, love that energy. Excellent. Um, so, so thank you for joining us at Datadog Summit London. Amazing to, to be back in London, uh, one of my favorite cities on Earth. Uh, actually, the only place I've ever lived outside of New York State, and uh, miss it whenever I'm not here. Always great when I'm back. <laughs> so really appreciate you taking time, spending a whole day with us today. Uh, we have a lot in store for you, and uh, we're, we're really, really excited about it. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm a VP here at Datadog. I'm going to be very brief, just some opening remark before I pass the mic off to people who have much, much more interesting things to say. So what is Datadog Summit? It's really uh, our celebration of customers, our, our celebration of our community, uh, which means you. It's a time where we can get together, share our experiences, share lessons learned. It's a little bit more of an intimate setting compared to something like Dash. And it's just a great way for us to chat and, and really be in a room together um, and learn from each other and hang out, get to know each other, hopefully have a laugh. So uh, one thing I'm curious about, you know, we've done summits all over the world, from New York to California, Berlin, Tokyo, Sydney. We've been a lot of places. London is the first place we came back to. It's the first city we've ever done a second Datadog Summit in. So I am curious, anyone in the crowd, have, were you here at London Summit 2018? Couple, couple, couple hands. Um, so yeah, a, a quite a bit different of a format, a quite a bit different of an organization. So uh, what I said, you know, shared, learn together, collaborate, uh, aspirational. What does that mean in practice? So here's the agenda for you. Started with registration and, and breakfast, hope you had fun. We already knocked one out for you. So short list and one of them's already out of the way. So now we're, we're into the content program. So what we're gonna do for the next two and a half hours is have four amazing customers share really innovative, interesting, compelling stories. And, and you know, getting to watch the dry runs yesterday, it's amazing what these organizations are doing and we're really, really excited to be able to share that with you. And then we're gonna have three folks from our product team talking about everything from security to front end monitoring to AI and ML in a, a very pragmatic, practical way. Uh, you're gonna learn quite a bit about anomalies, so uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, and that's going to be, you know, the next two and a half hours, as I said. Really something for everyone. The stories that we've picked for you run the gamut. So regardless of whether you're a platform engineer, an SRE, a front-end developer, you're in security, uh, there's something for everyone. After that, that's, that's a long time, two and a half hours. We're going to break for lunch and recharge. We also have a bunch of things during lunch for you. So once you're done eating, plenty of opportunities for networking and other things. And then we're going to jump right back into the content program. This is, is more than we've ever done at a summit in one time slot, so I'm gonna dig in just a little bit more into that in one second. But then four o'clock, networking, after a long day of sh sharing, learning, uh, it's gonna be great to get together, like I said, hopefully have a laugh, get to know each other. One thing I've always found amazing about summits is there'll be two people in the room and they'll kind of look and notice each other and they're actually friends, didn't know they were both Datadog customers, and they'll kind of run up to each other, they're both excited, and that energy is one thing that I think is just amazing about an event like this. And then five o'clock, Bob's your uncle, we'll have you out of here on time. So as I said in that 145 slot, this is a packed, packed agenda. Uh, in this room here, we're gonna have a Datadog on episode, live, filmed live, streamed, uh, and also ask an SRE. While most of the rest of the content is hands-on, uh, this is gonna be participatory sessions. So in that Datadog On episode, you're gonna have Martin and Edward uh, talk about how we're running stateful workloads on Kubernetes. Plenty of time for questions, and, and we want your participation in that. And then, as you can guess, ask an SRE. We have one of our most senior SREs, along with an SRE from Google. This is a great opportunity. The cameras are gonna cut for this episode. So ask those difficult questions. Really, really get in there and, and share and learn together. And like I said, that's gonna be no, no cameras, no recording, just some authentic discussion about the challenges of, of building a, a true SRE practice. The rest of the things you see here are hands-on workshops, so you will need a laptop. We're gonna drop you into a live Kubernetes environment, real Datadog uh, accounts, uh, and get some practical hands-on applied learning for Almost, again, something for everyone, almost all areas of the product, from introduction, whether you're an SRE or a developer, security, front end, something for everyone. And as they say, but wait, there is more. 
all throughout the day from kind of product demo stations. Uh, AWS Game Day and Coterm Battle, I saw it was super busy this morning, so if you haven't had a chance to check it out, two kind of li little bit competitive learning experiences. Uh, Coterm Battle is, is brand new for us. It's the first time we've ever done it at an event, and it's, it's pretty cool. I got a chance to check it out a little while ago. The hallway tracks, as I said, like learning together is a huge part of this event. So whether it's a customer talking to someone from Datadog, a customer talking to a customer, just stop someone, ask them what they're working on, ask them where they work. Uh, if you see someone from Datadog, you know, we're, we're a very collaborative open organization. We genuinely just want to have a chat about anything you think is interesting. And then discussion with PMs, we have a ton of our product folks here. Uh, you can find them ad hoc, especially the ones that on, on the stage will be easy to identify, but if you want to know who's here, just track any of us down and ask. You can also book a meeting. I know they're almost full at this point, but if you'd like to book a meeting explicitly, let us know and we'll get that done for you. And of course, we have an on-call lounge. We do appreciate many of you are on call right now. Let's hope for no incidents today, but if you do have one, we have a quiet place for you to hopefully get that resolved quickly and get back to the content program. If you haven't had a chance to connect to Wi-Fi yet, here is the SSID. Uh, we did make sure there's very fast, ample Wi-Fi. I know one of the things that really grinds my gears about events sometimes is you go to a tech event, they know you're on call and you can't connect to the network, so uh, that's not gonna happen here. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Ara, who's gonna be your MC for the day. Again, really appreciate you joining us for the day today. Ended up being amazing weather, which I was super happy to see. And uh, if there's anything I can help with throughout the show, please do find me. Again, my name is Jeremy. And with that, Ara Polito. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so I wanted to start uh, this Dadog Summit talking about a topic that I've been thinking about in a couple of months, which is the pace of innovation. But before we dive into that, uh, do, you, do you recognize this place? What is? Okay, I hope you do. Um, this is Piccadilly Circus. Um, this picture was taken in around 2015. Uh, the photographer was very committed because uh, you have to be there very early to get an empty, empty space there. But what is interesting for me about this picture is that this one was taken only 10 years before that. And there are several differences between those two pictures. Obviously, one is the resolution. It's a lot lower. Um, there are people here, so no wake up early to get the picture. Uh, but more importantly, this is the difference that I, for me, it's, it's uh, very interesting. Like those static ads that we used to have are not there anymore because LEDs. And it's, for me, it's incredible that those two pictures are only 10 years apart. And I was thinking about this last February. We were in New York for a team meeting, and I was walking around Times Square with some colleagues. I don't know if you've been at Times Square in the past 15 years, but it's like Piccadilly Circus times 30, maybe. LED screens everywhere like huge ones, um, a little bit like a little bit overwhelming, a little bit too much. So I was talking to, to a colleague, Jason, who is in the audience somewhere, and I was like telling, okay, this was all a mistake. It's, we should just go back to just the red and green LEDs. Um, obviously, it was a joke. I mean, LED technology is, is, has dramatically changed our lives in many, many ways for the best that it's difficult for us to think about our lives without them anymore. Um, but because it happened overnight, almost, like from one, no having LED screens, no anywhere, to everywhere in such a small span of time, it kind of feels that it was like, like an overnight success, but it actually took a lot of foundation to get us there. So this is more or less very, very high level timeline of LED technology. Um, it actually started on the early uh, 20th century, thinking about that possibility of having um, LEDs. It, was, it wasn't until it was early 1960 that we got the red LED. Um, and very soon after, we got actually green, yellow, amber. So we started thinking that we could be into something that is, was very revolutionary, but actually the blue LED uh, took us a little bit longer. Um, 
It wasn't until the early 1990s that we finally got a high efficient blue LED that really unlocked everything else. So thanks to that blue LED, we, were, we started getting white bulbs um, emitting white light, but also LED screens in the late 1990s and early 2000s, we started having those screens and suddenly everything exploded. And obviously, very important milestone in this history, um, I, 2024, I got completely overwhelmed at Times Square. But what I'm thinking is that uh, what it sometimes feel like sudden success is usually built on top of a very good foundation. Um, this is similar to Datadog. If you, if you look at Datadog today, you may think that we are releasing products every single month and we are doing more and more, but that was only possible because we built in a very strong foundation. When Datadog was founded in 2010, our founders took two years without releasing anything at all, just thinking about the vision of breaking down silos and thinking what's the best way to get us there. For them, the best way to get us there is, was infra-monitoring, because if you think about cloud computing, everything sits on, obviously, on your infrastructure. For five years, when they launched infra-monitoring, that was the only product that they had, because they, want to get, they wanted to get that foundation right. Once you get the foundation layer right, then you can unlock all the rest of the innovation. When they were happy about it, we started moving up the stack of your applications to the APM, to logs, profiling, RAM, et cetera, security, et cetera, et cetera. So um, going back to, to that, everything, once you get that foundation, it's very easy to connect the dots. It's very easy to say, okay, everything that we do can be connected back to that first thinking of breaking down silos. That's the goal that Datadog had at the beginning. That's the goal that we have today. But if you think about uh, going back to the blue LED, the blue LED was a means to an end. Um, nobody wanted to create a blue LED because it was cool to have a blue one. It was because it unlocked having everything else. It basically unlocked you having a very high definition screen on your phone or your watch, or me talking to you with those screens on my back. It was a means to an end. Similarly, Datadog is a means to an end. We don't build Datadog for the sake of building Datadog. We build Datadog to unlock your own innovation, our customers' innovation because that's what we do. It's a means to an end. We are just enablers of your innovation. So we accelerate so you can accelerate as well. And that is why everything that we do at Datadog, we put our customers at the very center. Um, everything that we do, we think about the problems you are solving, not the problems we are solving. We are solving your problems, not ours. And I really, really love how this works. Like, if you think about greater innovation, that's how it happens. It happens by all of us building on top of each other. So that's why at Datadog Summit, we also put our customers at the very center. So we are going to listen today to very great innovation stories from Electrolux, Flipdish, Aviva, and Dunel. So I really hope you learn a lot today from the sessions, from the workshops, um, but also, more importantly, that you take the opportunity to share and learn with each other, because that's how greater innovation happens. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, Kristina Kondrashevich from Electrolux. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> uh, last week, when I was on KubeCon in Paris, people started to speak with me German. So I just want to prevent this situation in advance and say that Electrolux is a Swedish company, same as Spotify, IKEA, and many others companies from Sweden. 
And uh, uh, my name is Christina. I work as a SRE product manager at Electrolux. My goal is to keep our systems reliable and developers happy. So do we have developers here? SRE folks? Yay! Hi, Infra people. Yo, my favorite people in the world, really. I love to work with all of you guys. So, um, yeah, uh, IoT domain is quite difficult and complex one to work on, and uh, I will tell you why. So, when we imagine the future, we usually imagine how our life uh, will change and uh, how these technologies will integrate in our daily routine. We often imagine the kitchen, and I believe everyone saw this movie when there is a microwave, you put the chicken, and then one, not the chicken, just something in this microwave, and then in one second, there is like a big chicken, grilled chicken or something like this in one second. Uh, I don't know how healthy it is, but uh, what already uh, like available in IoT industry is that you have this oven at home, provisioned and connected via your mobile phone, and then you can use voice assistant uh, to actually communicate with uh, this device. You can put vegetables or meat inside of the oven, and then there will, that oven will capture the image, send it to the internet, the food will be recognized, and then oven by itself will set up the proper temperature, duration, and mold for you. So to build all these possible and impossible use cases, we have a firmware team that makes the brain of appliances smarter. We have a team of backend engineers. They are build connectivity cloud. And then we have mobile team and designers to provide the meaningful digital experience with our appliances via app. And of course, we have SRE platform engineering team. That's how IoT uh, look like in one slide. I tried to simplify it for you. So we run our services from free regions. We multi-cloud. We um, need to support all the types of the appliances. We also need to support third-party integrations, as I mentioned, like voice assistants, for example. And then if you have uh, your first day as a developer at Electrolux, you can be kind of overwhelmed with this work environment that you need to... <laughs> uh, you need to learn about to actually be successful. So we have majority of services on AWS, but uh, we also run some services on Azure, IBM, and GCP. And uh, for those platforms, if you use different cloud providers, you usually, for historical or budget reasons, use dedicated uh, observability tools, how it was for us as well. And uh, when it comes to troubleshooting, and uh, our team needs to handle this, you need to go to each observability platform and then look into what's happening with your mobile app and then what is happening actually on the container level or in, in your connectivity cloud or even on the appliance level, so it's quite hard. And uh, we made the decision, like, obvious one, that we need to move everything into one observability platform. Uh, but it was the big challenge, I would say, to choose the one that will meet all the requirements, because it's, uh, as I said, quite complex. And uh, yeah, the systems itself are, are highly complex. And we chose Datadog. There's uh, some dashboards, then I remember how people started to build dashboards because that's usually what we do, right, uh, in the first time when we enter the platform. But what I remember is this warm feeling Then one engineer lead came to our team and said, here's the incident happening, <laughs> ongoing incident uh, in production. And uh, I mean, of course, he was frustrated about it, but we were happy because they started to monitor production, uh, which was super cool for us. And uh, the next thing, I think that was the first step towards some kind of gamification. We noticed that, yes, some people are 
kind of advanced already, and they started to uh, evaluate more features in observability platform. But some use only basic functions like logs, uh, yeah, searching logs, and it's actually happened because that's what they used in their tools before. So they didn't know about other opportunities, other features that uh, observability platform Datadog can provide for them. So what we've done, we decided that we need to teach and uh, we do write the docs and we recorded a lot of video for developers and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yes, uh, and then we started to think what's, what's, what to do. And then uh, we had an idea to bring the chaos engineering and uh, make it via some gamification. So let's just have two options, to read the docs and play the game. So honestly, what would you choose? Thank you for being honest. <laughs> yes, of course. So we reach out to Datadog team and they helped us to connect to other customers uh, who already did uh, Chaos Engineering games before. And also I get very lucky because I have a PhD in Chaos Engineering in my team. Uh, guys, if you're watching me, I miss you a lot. So <laughs> um, yeah, we decided to launch Chaos Game Day. Um, Chaos engineering, first of all, helps you to catch the abnormal behavior and normal behavior during the experiments, how, how your systems behave and also actually how you, your developers behave. We started our preparation with <clears throat> choosing the targeting system. Actually, um, it's not common to use staging, but we decided to not run Chaos in production for safety reasons. And, uh, we, choose, we chose staging, we told our developers that we are going to attack their services, and uh, we designed our experiments the way so they could use not only log searching, but also metric analysis for, uh, metric analysis about performance and uh, uh, trace, uh, tracings, uh, analysis, trace analysis about latency, so they could uh, actually learn more about the platform. Uh, so we chose this approach, capture the flags, CTF, uh, and uh, CTF is when you place some flags like a string or metric name into your target system, and then developers need to find it. We also, through the day, we revoked access for this environment, for our developers, and force them to use only Datadog. Of course, we did some registration and uh, yeah, all this preparation, the logistic. <clears throat> uh, so we had uh, 41 developers participated from four countries, 12 teams, and we've got 181 submissions. So it's not all of them obviously correct. We also have this uh, dashboard uh, below uh, for uh, kind of what we've done basically we put like big TV and uh, a part of their monitors and laptops they looked into this TV so they could know like who is leading right now so this leadership dashboard we also placed in Datadog. Um, a part of these seven experiments so it's not related, but there is a valuable findings. It also was seven. They actually found some things to fix in their system, but it wasn't related to the cows that we ran. <laughs> yeah. Um, and everything what we've done was manual. So all the submissions, checking the Slack channel, everything was done manually. But the feedback was super positive. Because first of all, they, there was a lot of people who never touched Datadog at that moment. Also, there were many people who never touched the core systems. So they work, for example, for some other services and they have this API calls to core system, but they never actually uh, tried to work with it. And uh, also, we've got feedback that people 
uh, felt that it was like a team building for them because sometimes you don't meet often with your colleagues. Um, yeah, and uh, there was one girl. Uh, she said uh, that she was kind of frustrated because she was looking for the flag uh, during the game and uh, there was no visibility from the mobile app. And uh, she worked as a mobile backend developer. So that was kind of her fault that they didn't prioritize to have real user monitoring at that moment. And after this game day, everything was set up. People started to set up monitors, alerts. We were extremely happy. But as I said, everything what we've done as a SRE team was done manually. So we were checking these submissions, communicated via Slack, uh, updated this uh, dashboard, uh, leaderboard, a uh, leadership dashboard in Datadog. And uh, after this game day, people said, let's do it again. <laughs> but yeah, but it's like high investment activity, same as we have today, just gather all the people and uh, to make the, the really great show, it's a lot of work. So we thought like, okay, what should we do? And uh, we decided to connect chaos engineering and platform engineering together. So we, when we started our observability journey uh, and we moved a lot of stuff uh, into one platform, we actually started to get, uh, get less messages from developers and we had some capacity to work on the things that we wanted to work for a long time. So that's just the example how our morning looked like before. Like you open your laptop and then there's developers and they need to uh, have access to something like user onboarding for the new people and then they need to provision some resources and uh, onboard their services and like many, many other things. So we wanted to um, reduce this workload and that's why we started to build our internal developer platform. And uh, that's a very simplified version how it looked like. So we used, and we still use, Backstage as a UI, uh, the whole backend uh, written by our team, and uh, this is like a double side platform. So from one side, our platform engineering team put templates for developers so they could provision infrastructure, and then from another side, developers web, via web UI can provision and manage infrastructure. That's the one example that I wanted to share with you. We run <coughs> our services on Kubernetes. Uh, that's why usually developers need to, pr need to have provision uh, EKS uh, quite often. Uh, and the, the, I think the benefit of having everything automated, uh, obviously uh, a part of uh, that uh, <laughs> we reduce our workload, is also that they don't need to think about uh, how to how to have logs and metrics in Datadog because it's done via our automation. We already defined it in our template. So with zero knowledge of infrastructure, they're actually able to manage it and uh, have everything already in place in Datadog. That's how we solve this problem. That's a simple screenshot. And if a developer has certain permissions, then um, on this slide they can uh, uh, see, you can see the list of resources that they can manage. And uh, here, one more example is just the overview of uh, one EKS. And um, a part of it, they, there's many features for them, like they do uh, the Kubernetes management, so they can kill the pod directly or manual deployment, or they can just execute their Terraform to do REST API changes because they need it frequently. So. Since we had this uh, opportunity to work on it, um, yeah, we decided to embed one more feature because it's like single entry and developers anyway will use this there. And we put uh, like a small button for scheduling and configuring experiments uh, where you can choose the default model, uh, put uh, like uh, the value of latency or error type there. And uh, after you will click there, 
then it will appear in your Datadog dashboard because that's all connected in one ecosystem. So the reason why we've done this, it's just because we believe that this is the best way to learn about your system resilience via failures of the system. Um, so that's actually overall uh, the result of this observability journey we had. So usually I ask like people from other companies who does troubleshooting in your company? Is it SRE or is it developers? Developers, good, yes. Uh, and then for me it's the same because we moved this responsibility to developers since they understand infrastructure better and uh, since they have everything in place in observability platform, then it's easier for them because they know their applications better than we do. And I don't remember how many digital products we have now at Electrolux, it's like more than 200, I think. And uh, it's just impossible to understand what, uh, what people do for their applications. So that was the first, the biggest impact, I think, that we, in 90% of cases, don't even aware that some incident is happening because they are able to resolve this incident without us and find the root cause. Uh, the second is that we have much less incidents. Of course, it's not only because of uh, chaos engineering and observability platform. There is uh, many different efforts here, but still uh, we have much less incidents and um, incident management itself is followed very well because when we do chaos engineering, we actually also train to declare incident and uh, how to open communication channel. We do our postmortems post in Datadog and uh, <clears throat> uh, like we, we, we learn about how to provide proper logs, proper metrics, so the incident could be resolved quicker. And the last one, I think it's also important because developers, they started to think more about designing their systems and uh, they also started to consider cost on, as a, one of the parameters, what kind of logs they're sending uh, away. So that's the observability impact we had. For the next steps, uh, we would love to continue our chaos engineering journey and we would love to evolve this feature um, and actually collect more feedback, but basically, uh, we, like, as I said, we, we believe that learning uh, about resilience of your system via failures is, is the best way to learn. There is no graph that will help you developers to understand everything. This visualization doesn't work only when you have it in practice. And another, uh, it's, we would love to empower our developers to understand more about their services and performance via scorecards we are looking into how to actually uh, have it because <laughs> today I learned on the demo stand that Datadoc has uh, the better version of it. But yeah, we've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, I have no time left for questions, but uh, it's like a <laughs> ticking clock. <laughs> time is clocking, I see it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just um, you can find me it's easy to recognize me. I have a red <laughs> sweater. So I was happy to share this journey with you. Thank you. Awesome job. That was, that was great, Christina. Thank you. I, I think it was very interesting to see how something that started as a way to learn an observability tool uh, ended up being improving engineering practices at an old engineering organization, which is, which is great. Uh, so next up is Max Edouin. Uh, he's a product manager at Datadog, and he's going to be talking about security. security. Hi, everyone. There's way more people than yesterday during rehearsal. Um, my name is Max, and I'm a product manager at Datadog, and I'm excited to be here today to talk about security, everyone's favorite topic. Um, 
So before we get started, um, I got your sense earlier, but I want to know, show of hands, if anyone here identifies as working in tech. <laughs> okay, cool. Like, I'm sorry if someone didn't raise their hand. This is not the right place to be. Um, DevOps, SREs, DevOps, show of hands. Okay, quite a, quite a few folks. Uh, security. Oh, okay, okay, great. And then the rare DevSecOps person. That might be one. Okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, um, like, it's very interesting to think about like the DevOps journey, right? We went from um, yearly releases to uh, daily, right? So once, um, it's quite simple, right? Like we talk about the pace of innovation, we talk about why we're doing this, it's really a competitive advantage, right? You innovate more rapidly, you bring more products to the market, you create value for your company, uh, and everyone's happy. And so this, of course, didn't happen by itself, right? Like the environment and like the way we work had to change drastically with this, right? Like from the different cloud providers, the technology, the way apps are built, the way they're shipped, the way they're observed, um, but also the skill sets of the different teams involved, right? And, and how we can do that, right? And so for security, this is the same thing. They cannot be blocking. They cannot say, stop everything you're doing, like this has to be secure first. They have to adapt their practices and their processes to be part of this, right, and to be part of, a, of the trend. And so, and so we, see, we see security, and when it comes to it, there is a clear challenge. We've seen it in the room. Maybe the room is a bit biased because this is an observability conference, but there were a few more dev and dev and ops than, than security folks. Um, and and those, those people, they have a lot to cover. They have a lot of things to do with absolutely zero context, right? what those service so-and-so does. They don't know, um, and they shouldn't know. Um, and then on the other end of the, of the spectrum, we have like dev and ops, and, and we're like badgering them with fixing like thousands of vulnerabilities or, or issues that are relevant for them um, because they don't impact the system, um, or operators that have to build and manage like security software that like actually breaks the environment in production, and, and like that's kind of like complicated. And so if we, if we look at this a bit more um, in details, like I want to take the example of like vulnerability management, um, and I'm going to start with a, with a simple question. Uh, there are developers in the room. I've seen some hands. So what, what happens? What do you do when, when you see a vulnerability? Ooh, someone's saying fixing it. OK. Hmm? Turn the screen off, that's, that's right, exactly. You do nothing, um, and, and that makes sense because what, vulnerabilities come with a bunch of problems, right? Like the, the first thing we see is that like, this is the, the NVD database, so National Vulnerability Database. It's maintained by a, by a US government agency. There is like more than 200K um, vulnerabilities listed in there. More than half are like high or critical, right? So, if everything is a, is, is a priority, nothing becomes a priority, and that makes it very hard to understand which one do I actually care about. Um, and, and, it, and they're not doing anything wrong, actually. Like, the way they manage and rate vulnerabilities is that they have to account for the worst case scenario, and so that makes it complicated for them. The second thing is, um, this is a great example, actually, from, uh, from this person, uh, uh, Swedish, uh, absolutely, like, maintainer of the, of the curl, um, utilities, there are about like three of them, uh, and they receive a report on HackerOne that there is a vulnerability in their system where actually it was just nonsense coming from generative AI uh, submitted on, on HackerOne for them. So they have to deal with the reports and they basically waste their time trying to figure out like what actually happens. And so of course, some bad stuff slips through, through, the, through the cracks. Um, and the last piece is, I work in security, I've been working in security for a minute now, and I still see this kind of stuff, and I have no idea what this means. So please, uh, if you know, find me, help me. Uh, anyway, like, security is a, is a very word, like, with, with reports made for, for experts. And so, talking to, to a bunch of you, a bunch of customers, a bunch of folks on, on the space, this is what we, we really, like, hear from, uh, from them, is as a DevOps team, I'm a developer, I'm an operator, like, I don't want anyone else to tell me what to do. I want to own everything within my scope, right? Um, and so the first thing I want to do is I want to prioritize the work I have to do. I want to understand 
if the vulnerability that I've seen has an impact on my system, if it's worth fixing it, um, if, if this is something I should do or not, if there is a risk, if there is anything happening. The second thing is what I want to integrate this with, work flow, with my workflows, right? Like, when do I need to be woken up at night, if ever? Do I need to, be, to do something today? Do I need to be put it in the backlog and do it when I have time and, uh, and when I, uh, like, triage through this? Triage thing. Through it. Uh, the last piece, the, the next piece, sorry, is, uh, is really, like, DevOps team already have, like, a bunch of tools. They have, like, their processes in place. And if you add something on the side, like, that's not working, right? Like, the, the work needs to happen where the work happens. And so you cannot, like, put security aside. Uh, from the IDE to your production monitoring, right? Like, this is where the, the, the work is done. Um, and when you think about security, a lot of folks are talking about shifting lefts, uh, which is great, but my question is, do you only fix bugs in your unit tests, right? Like, this is really something you need to have, like, bug tracking through the life cycle, uh, and security is, is, is basically the same thing. Um, and the last piece is, uh, as we have SLOs, SLAs, like how do you improve over time? And, and really, like those folks like care about security, care about having like secure system, and they want to improve over time. Now, if we if we speak to a few friends uh, that are in security here, uh, really their job is the the same, but across the entire organization, right? So they want to reduce the risks for the overall business. Um, and how do they do that? Like, very, very similar to SREs, like, they can't do it themselves, right? Like, they really need to, to have uh, and to make the dev and operators owners of the security within their scope, right? And how do they do that? They need to empower them to succeed, and they really need to be available for them as experts when something happens, right? Like, jumping an incident, help remediating something, help understanding that, like, what is, the, what is this, uh, this thing? While, at the same time, focusing on new risks they want to tackle, like building more rules, extend, expanding their coverage, really doing the thing that they don't have time to do today because they are just like busy chasing uh, whether this vulnerability has been fixed or not. Has been fixed or not. Something, something they want to focus on uh, is, um, this is a lot of big words, mitigating gaps with compensating control, right? But basically what this means is that like, there's compliance audits, there's a bunch of things happening, and the answer is not necessarily fixing. Patching a vulnerability is not always possible. Patching a security issue is not always possible. And so what do you put in place instead of that? Like sometimes you configure your WAF, you apply protection on the vulnerable endpoint, you, you do certain things so that like this problem cannot be exploited uh, in real life. Uh, and the last piece, as usual, they want to improve, right? Like your security posture is what it is today, the risk of the business is what it is, but you always want to like get better and do better and across the entire organization. So, and, and so they want to manage that and set up the different policies to do that. And so really, like this is the same word, um, you have to, the same journey you have to take when you think about increasing your reliability, uh, and it's a very big parallel with like SRE and DevOps, and, and like even the, the SRE guidebook from, from Google is a, great, is a great read on that. Like, but all of this happened, didn't happen in a day. Um, the, the first thing you need to do is really start from understanding where you are today, uh, and it cannot be like, here's the list of things you have to fix, there is 50,000 items in there, Tell me when you're done. Like this is really something collaborative to, to work between the, the development teams and the, and the security teams. The second thing is similarly, like not everything needs to be 5.9 SLA. Not everything needs to be patched, right? Like so, so like the goal cannot be fix everything. Like what is the right acceptable risks for for your organization, the specific service, etc. And the and the last piece is like the goals need to be aligned between the different teams. If security is pushing in that direction and the development teams are pushing in these other directions, like of course this is not gonna work and the collaboration's not gonna happen. And so um, I, I wanna take a minute to, to show you these principles in, in action in the, in the data log for security products. I'm gonna show you a, a, a quick few slides. Uh, I'd be really happy to talk to you if you have uh, some interest after, after this, right? The, the first one is really centralizing the assessment. So this is the, the service catalog. In, a, in Datadog, you can see all of your uh, reliability, performance things you can do with, uh, with Datadog. You can, like, in this case, look at all of the teams, the services that are owned by this team, and like the vulnerability, uh, the presence of vulnerabilities or not, uh, as well as the attack exposure, right? So it's really, like, for the teams themselves so they can focus on their scope 
and then for the, the security team so they can understand kind of like the posture overall, right? Um, the, the second thing, and this is my, like one of my favorite things we, we do, is like we leverage both the observability context we have as well as like the hundreds um, ever-growing uh, amount of integrations we have to update the severity of, uh, of things we find, in this case, the vulnerability. Um, and, and this example is great because it starts as a critical vulnerability. Critical vulnerability, I don't know what critical means in, in, in your world, but to me, critical means I need to stop what I'm doing and I need to go at it right now. Um, however, this is not in a service that is exposed to attack. It's, yes, it's running in production, but there's no service exposed to attack. The, the world doesn't actually know how to exploit this vulnerability, so there is very little chance that an attacker is gonna try to, to do this. Um, and then the, the probability of exploitation um, is very low, right? And so all of this put together makes it that like this vulnerability doesn't, does not need you to stop what you're doing and to go ahead and fix it. This is something you can do when you have the time uh, and you can, you can prioritize uh, later. And then as I said earlier, you cannot always uh, patch in the time you have to patch, right? If, if you need to patch within a day, this is not always possible. Well, the patch might not even exist, like this, uh, this vulnerability might be there, but like there might not be an option. It might require uh, an upgrade from a 2.0 to a 3.0 and, uh, and that has a lot of breaking change or, um, or like this specific repo and service on, on your organization might not be as well maintained as you'd want it to be and, and there's no one that can actually do that. And so Datadog also offers option to protect directly within the platform your applications and APIs from attacks, attacks attempting to exploit uh, those vulnerabilities. And so um, with that being said, I really have like three things to leave you with today. Uh, the first one is the only way for like the security um, initiatives to happen is to be empathetic, blameless, and communicative, right? Like it's really the same. You do blameless postmortem, or I hope you do. Uh, like this is really the same idea. Like pointing fingers never helped anyone uh, increasing a shared goal, right? Speaking of shared goals, this is what you like, got to do. Understand what each team is best at and focus on their expertise, right? Um, and the last one, reduce the friction. If there's anything that adds any sort of friction to your security initiatives, to fixing a vulnerability, to whatever, people are gonna look away, they're gonna close their screen, they're gonna ignore the Slack message. It needs to be done as part of your existing workflows and it needs to be done uh, like where, where people are, are looking at. That being said, happy to talk to all of you uh, today and, uh, and thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Max. Um, and I think we are going to listen a lot to these uh, topics of breaking down silos, working together, being empathetic throughout the day. Okay, so next up is Tolia Apostolidis from Flipdish. And he's going to be talking about a very exciting project that they started and finished in a very noble ways. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Ara, for that introduction. From all the introductions I've had, that was probably the most recent one I've had. So that was, thank you very much. Um, so today, speaking to a little bit to what Ara was talking about, engineering practices and developer experience and breaking down silos, not really gonna talk about observability or Datadog. It's more about three things I'd hopefully want everyone to go away with. Uh, number one, you can modernize your tech stack, but that happens incrementally. Number two, your tech stack choice is important. Not all tech stacks are born equal. And number three, ways of working are even more important than your tech stack. So the two are coupled together. Um, my full name is Apostolis Apostolidis. People know me as Tolly. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at Flipdish, I'm leading a team called Delivery Enablement. And I joined Flipdish about um, almost a year ago. And it, Flipdish is a very exciting um, new era. It's part of a, new, a very exciting new era of uh, restaurant tech companies that are there to battle the mar marketplaces that you all know. Hopefully, you're not here. Um, to 
uh, to offer to independent restaurants, small restaurants, small businesses, uh, the opportunity to um, have simple tech, both for hardware and software, to run their, their business, run their restaurants. And today's three things I want to go through. So number one, why we tackled restaurant loyalty, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Straight into number two, which is the, the, the most important one, how we served restaurant loyalty to the customers. And number three, what we learned is what we achieved from there. So to start with, I sort of hinted at that, but like independent restaurants are small businesses that are usually relying on out-of-date solutions. Um, they have um, physical um, cards to stamp for loyalty. They've got uh, third-party companies that are all integrated. It's a very fragmented industry. Um, so they do like rewarding their loyal customers, which is why you see all those kind of cards all the time wherever you go to small restaurants. And they want to do that both online, so online ordering, but also in person when you go and order food in person. The reason for that is loyal customers generate 10x more revenue than one-time eaters. So they have a real incentive um, to do this. So that's kind of the main reason why we, we decided to tackle this problem of offering restaurants the ability to run loyalty programs both online and in store. But also, something hopefully we're not alone with this, we actually promised it to a customer. <laughs> so we had to actually uh, deliver this. It made loads of sense, but we promised it to Upfire Pizza in Ireland. Uh, we're, um, we're an island-based company. Um, so we said we're going to do it. So next question was, well, OK, how are we going to do that? How, how, how are we going to approach this problem? How are we going to offer satisfyingly simple loyalty across both in person and online? So we jumped onto this opportunity um, this increment, I guess, of um, our software to say, right, okay, how can we do this differently? How can we actually evolve our architecture, evolve our tech stack, our ways of working um, with this opportunity? So we decided to deliver Loyalty360, which is what we termed it, um, but also at the same time demonstrate a better way of working, but also pave the way for other teams. And that, that third one was really, really important. So this is the story of one loyalty customer uh, problem, two small teams. Uh, some members of the teams are here. Hey, Ian, James, and Chad. Um, and five ingredients um, of what I think was success. And this was over four months, which includes Christmas, so it doesn't really count, about two and a half to three months. And these are the five ingredients um, that I think were really, really important for our journey in those three or four months. First of all, start with events. Secondly, go serverless. Number three, support the team. Number four, work together. And finally, and probably my favorite, show the thing. So I'll go step by step to show you what, what these mean. Has anyone, just a quick show of hands, used or heard of a technique called event storming? Yeah? Not too many. What about event? Keep your hand up if you've heard of, or put your hand up if you've used event modeling before. Perfect. Awesome. A handful of hands. <laughs> um, so you can look up what event modeling is, uh, eventmodeling.org, but we use this technique, which is very similar to event modeling, uh, but it's something that helped us articulate what we want to build. And more importantly, it wasn't only one person, the UX uh, designer or the product person. It was everyone in the team actually uh, designing this model. We start with events. So you could probably argue that this, you can't, everyone can understand these events. Sale created, loyalty card stamped, phone number entered sale paid, et cetera. And then I think Aram, Aram mentioned it earlier um, about customer interactions. These are actual customer interactions where the person on the tail asks the person who's um, putting in the order, do you want to be part of our loyalty program? They say yes, then they ask for their phone number, all that kind of, kind of stuff. That was one of the first things we did. We thought about the user. And this is an example of one of the models, many of these, but this model model is actually the first visit to a store, but you've ordered online before. So that's the, um, and you identify yourself as a phone, uh, with a phone number. And the goal is that if you've ordered online, you get one stamp, then you go into the store, you get a second stamp. And if you zoom into this, I won't go through the notation too much, um, but uh, event modeling uses commands, events, and views, and you can see how it sort of works. You create a sale, which is a command that creates an event called sale created. Then with a customer interaction, you get the phone number entered, as I mentioned earlier. You get a view of a phone number, and, yeah, and something happens in the background, and you upset the phone, the, the customer. This is one of the first things that we did. And that was really good to start. Like Once you've 
put this out on a, on a mirror board, you can start then thinking about the system. So the next thing we did is we went, we chose to move to serverless. We were traditionally in Azure, we were in the cloud, we, we, we have, we're very much .NET um, house, but we actually thought, well, we'll break from that. We'll go AWS, Lambda, um, use things like DynamoDB, a serverless database, and use something like SST, which really amplifies that developer experience. And I've probably missed a trick here with like uh, some kind of uh, pizza uh, place uh, analogy. Um, but really, the difference between the two paradigms, the one on the left is um, where your streamlined team or your, the team that delivers the, fe the feature of the product owns the apps. And then the platform team, which is the team that I, I work in, has manages the cloud hosting services, the cloud governance. And that has, speaking to the previous talk, that that has connotations with dev and ops and all the decisions that need to be made uh, and what decisions are made uh, based on that. Whereas moving serverless, you still have the team owning the apps, but you, they also own their own serverless services. They're not relying on a different team. And the platform team can really focus on um, cloud governance. And in a way, um, one, of, one of my colleagues, uh, Mark, put it really, really well. It's, it's all about how can you lift yourself out of a locked, local optima. It's not that we weren't in a good position. We were, and we could have easily moved to something like .NET or just continued where we were. But we wanted to wander away a bit and see, go a bit further down and then see if we can find a higher hill. And that's where we thought, you know, we went from something like .NET Framework or .NET to, to, to AWS Lambda. And for reference, I won't go too much into this. Um, if anyone's heard of Simon Wardley, um, there's a great talk online called um, Crossing the River, Filling the Stones, I think. And that's where you can um, have uh, hear a great argument about moving serverless. And this was in 2018. And in terms of developer experience, this is uh, another colleague of mine, Tamash. Um, Noticed that 11 a.m. we started writing some code, and by 20 past two, he's written a post saying we're good, we're good, we're ready for the show and tell. That was something we weren't used to, and is an amazing step improvement of our developer experience. Obviously, I think they've had lunch as well in between, uh, hopefully. Um, so the third thing, and this is where we start thinking a bit more in terms of how we go about doing this. Th the third thing is supporting the team. So I'm going to use um, notation from Teams Apologies, if anyone's aware of this, but Restaurant360 is a team that delivered the product, um, and they said, we want to build a Loyalty360 service that integrates with existing systems. And we're like, great, okay, but you need to then speak to all these other teams and collaborate with them and co collaborate with our team, deliver enablement, and that's great because it's, if you do it for a short term, there's loads of innovation. We can work together on these things, and it's great, but then if you do it for too long, that really reduces fast flow. So where you want to get to is to this more clean um, way of working over time where the, the three teams on the top are working independently or autonomously and the, the delivery enablement team is offering um, things as a service. Um, so you increase fast flow, you reduce cognitive load and everything is great. But you need to be quite intentional when you do this. So for example, Restaurant 360 would look after the application and the infrastructure because we've chosen the tech stack that will allow them to do this. And delivery enablement will think about, well, how can I introduce AWS to the team in terms of capabilities? How can I govern AWS and things like that? And ways of working as well. So being very, very intentional with how you do this, I think is a very critical ingredient of how you deliver tech modernization. Fourth thing is working together. I can't emphasize enough how powerful it is to work together and forget about individual silos. Forget about handing out tickets to people and going away and reporting back. Because it can be quite liberating, whether we're talking about learning sessions, mobbing on code, designing with other teams, things like that. When we decided to go to AWS Serverless, one of the first things we did, we, we said, OK, let's jump on a call all together, watch a video. Watch a video. If you ever watched the video by uh, Rook Hulihan, there's no chance you can watch it at any speed. He talks really, really fast anyway. Um, but it's amazing. Like you can get loads and loads of context really quickly about how to work with DynamoDB. And this is the entire team, uh, including the CTO, the engineering director, we're all sat there watching the same video, building the same mental model. But then we jumped on the code, and we were writing code together, which is the, 
well, the reports that we got from the teams is much less stressful than any other uh, paradigm that we were used to. And when we're building this event model, we actually jumped on with other teams as well, and we actually designed the event model together or, or evolved it together because they had the context that, that the team was missing. So it's really, really important to think about doing things together. The final thing, and this was my favorite one, is show the thing. And show it every week and seek feedback. What do I mean by show the thing? There was, wherever I work, there's this culture of like, I, I can't show something that's not finished. I, I can't, it's too early. Oh, they won't be able to tell, them, tell us anything. And this is probably my favorite screenshot of the whole experience. It's a loyalty summary for a customer with emojis and some text returned by an AWS API gateway. And all the people on the call, there's the CEO on the left, stakeholders, all there, show, we're showing something that's very, very lean. And we did that every week. Um, other weeks, we showed the results of a survey that the, the UX designer um, composed and ran. Uh, or we would show a mirror board with the event model, things like that. But we did the, the survey in parallel, and we showed to the stakeholders so that we can get some feedback. Another thing, favorite thing for me is that we, we actually do a restaurant work experience and we do the restaurant Gemba walk as, it, as I've termed it, which is all about going to understand the systems and how they work with our, um, our systems and other systems as well. In this case, Mark learned all about how to make a bag of chips, salt and vinegar chips, taco chips, all these things. So he became a real expert. So with that, um, I think the key thing I want to share is what we achieved, what we learned along the journey. We, we tend to say that we want to build the right thing, but we want to build the thing right. So we have evidence that we build the right thing. So the first evidence is you can go online, you can accrue stamps, you can uh, get a text message, then you can, sorry, you can, this is in person, then you can go online, you can accrue uh, loyalty, the same, the same loyalty program uh, as well. We also got some great uh, feedback from Oakfire. Um, they said, you know, they speak very highly of loyalty. They, th they said it's amazing. So I guess I'll take that signal as a really good thing. Also, in terms of more quantitative numbers, we have um, the system being used even just three months after we started building it. But we also built the thing right. And this was really, really important to me. These are the five things that I, I noticed that I think are indicators that we built the thing right. First off, AWS Serverless. One thing I'll call out is DynamoDB. The teams were really, really, the team was really surprised at how effective DynamoDB was. Um, although there's a bit of a steep learning curve, it's actually a really um, joy to work with. Testability was baked in, so we wrote tests as we were trying to understand the system. We wrote tests about setting tags on spans as well, so we were testing our observability as we were going along, and we baked in observability. We did look at observability a bit later on. We didn't start from the very beginning, but we ended up with domain metrics on the top left. You can't really see it. Traces that are integrate with existing systems as well, but also looking at pipelines to keep that, um, those, those pipeline times low and the error uh, ratio quite low as well. Um, that's my only observability slide, by the way. <laughs> um, but then we also built decoupled systems. So we didn't just bolt loyalty onto orders. And it's interesting because orders and loyalty is something that you probably see as a classic paradigm or example of um, well-architected systems. But we built loyalty completely separately. And as, um, as a consequence, uh, uh, Mark had a, a light bulb moment where he said that, you know, actually, we can actually do things that we couldn't have done if we, if we built um, our system within orders itself. We built it separately so we can do things that weren't, wouldn't be possible otherwise. We've also taken a very, very event-driven approach. So if you think about the, the stick, if you cast your minds back to the sticky notes that I started with, with um, there's not exactly these, but things like order start and order place and order refund is implemented via lambdas that you store in Dynamo, then you've got a data capture change, you've got another lambda who puts things on a queue, and ultimately you do the thing that you care about, which is calculate rewards and calculate progress. This may seem complex, but it's resilient by default, and that's really powerful. We also did event, took an event sourced approach. Um, so we stored all the events in a single table and then we stored views and things like that. So we had to learn all of that, but we did it and it works. Um, so what worked really, really well? Um, the team was really happy with the, with the tech stack. Again, showing the thing means that the team was not a black box. Event modeling was really, really powerful and other teams are doing it now as well for big, even bigger projects. 
Um, more programming was liberating, and we, we took this dual track discovery and delivery approach uh, with UX, where we were writing the code but at the same time we were doing uh, the UX research, and that was really, really powerful as well. There was a lot of communication there. Obviously, it's not all uh, great, so um, in retrospect, what didn't go so well and what we, we learned on the, on, for our next project is we didn't, re we didn't re re revisit the event model as much as we'd like to. Um, the subsequent designs of, for example, Dynamo tables weren't as future-proof, but we've sort of corrected that already. Integration testing sort of felt behind. One important thing is actually moving to a completely new tech stack, actually getting historical data needs a bit more thinking, which we didn't do initially, and we are now. And when you go to serverless, if you release to only one customer, especially if you're in the restaurant tech industry where it's really, really quiet in the morning and there's like specific times where there's specific peaks, it, it, you can get cold starts, but that gets resolved once we um, release to all the customers. So to wrap up, um, how do we, we ask ourselves, how do we offer a satisfyingly simple loyalty uh, across in-person and online? These are the five ingredients of success, um, which can work together uh, interchangeably. And my learning is it is possible. We didn't go for the ideal system. It's not perfect but it absolutely did pave the way. And these are sort of our next steps. Other teams are adopting this model as well. And um, that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Tolly. Um, I think Tolly is, is great every time that I speak with him, um, how he thinks outside the box and think about how to better uh, build teams that work together. So if you have similar problems of maybe you're building a new service and you don't know where to start to get that connection between the different teams, go talk to him. He's great to speak to. Um, so yes, he will be around. Um, next up is Mael Lindsten. Uh, he's a product manager at Dadog, and we are going to be talking about user experience, which uh, Christina mentioned briefly on her talk. I think it's important, very important to take into account as well. So welcome, Mael. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Mael. I'm super excited to be in front of you today to talk about a product and a topic that is more recent uh, to Datadog uh, as opposed, for instance, to infrastructure monitoring. And this is the monitoring of user experience or something that we could encompass into a broader term that is front-end observability. The agenda for today is very straightforward. First, we'll go through a brief introduction about front-end observability. Then we'll look at a couple of signals uh, that you could leverage. And finally, I'll drive you through a real life story that happened to us recently as a case study. All right, let's get started. Um, from a workflow perspective, front-end observability is indifferent from a back-end one. You get signals that something's off. You investigate to understand the extent of the problem and pinpoint the root cause. Hopefully, you fix it. Uh, you monitor the fixes adoption and you collaborate throughout the entire process. And actually, side note, front-end and back-end observability are progressively merging. Everyone who engaged with us in the past has already heard this a countless amount of time, but the single pane of glass is real. You can get all the data points from all the back-end services and front-end applications of your stack in one single place. And this lets you pivot between the different components of your stack, the different products, to turn individual and granular telemetry into a more complete and meaningful story. Maybe you're being notified about the memory of uh, one of your hosts powering up your API service uh, being quite low. And drilling down further and looking at the processes being run, you realize that the request rate for one of the most memory intensive endpoint of your API is abnormally high. And pivoting back to your front end applications, back to the surface, you realize that there was a recent deployment that introduced a regression on your maybe web and mobile applications, and that led to this front end jamming your back end. But from a signals perspective, many companies, and us included, still heavily leveraged the good old escalation for throughput tickets and customer calls to get their observability, front end observability signals. 
maybe users are having troubles to do XYZ and they're rightfully complaining to your support channels. Or maybe you're just discussing with one of your customers and they're showing you how they're using your products and you're realizing that they have an overtly complex pattern because your product might not be simple enough to use or there might be some cumbersome uh, ways to use it. Um, and though nothing works better than a customer or a user being vocal about their pain points, actually proxies exist. Proxies exist to confront their feedback to quantitative data, find frustrations that users have not been uh, vocal about yet, and measure the overall health of your front-end applications. Let's dive into those right away. At Datadog, we use our own real user monitoring product uh, to measure our user experience and monitor the performance of our front-end applications, mobile and brother alike. If you're not familiar with this product, basically it collects a bunch of telemetry, performance, and behavioral ones from front-end applications. By telemetry, I mean, obviously, errors and crashes, crashes being preeminent in the mobile space. Resources that are being fetched, including latency and a bunch of other data points. Interactions from the users, the swipes, the clicks, the taps, and also including whenever users are being frustrated, you know, when they're rage clicking a button multiple times because nothing's happening on the screen. We're recording this. And a bunch of other telemetry, obviously. And because errors are often the most uh, critical telemetry that we're getting and the first one that we're looking at, we're also using our error tracking product to turn uh, these individual events into a more complete story. If you're not familiar with this, uh, with error tracking on Datadog, basically it groups individual crashes and non-fatal errors together based on their similarity to help you triage and troubleshoot fewer higher level issues instead of countless events uh, that would be very hard to navigate. So when we talk about front-end observability, combining RAM and error tracking and setting up some monitors on top of this is usually a good place to start. If you're not familiar with monitors, hopefully you are, but it's a product on Datadog that lets you define scenarios that you want Datadog to alert you on when they happen. Um, and as you might already know by now, at Datadog, we use heavily Datadog to monitor Datadog. Um, over the years, we figured out a pattern that works pretty well for us in terms of front-end observability. And um, at Datadog, every front-end team sets up at least two monitors to uh, check out their pages. One that alerts every time that there is a new issue in our tracking happening on one of the views that the team owns. And another one that alerts the team every time that the issue affects more than n users, and depending on the importance of the view. Now, let's look at a story that uh, happened to us recently. And here comes the tale of the translation bug. Um, what I'm going to show in the next few slides really happened to us a couple of weeks ago, uh, but for obvious confidentiality reason, I could not give you a live tour of the product. So I did my best to create a photo commit out of screenshots, so hopefully you wouldn't get bored. Let's see how it goes. A couple of weeks ago, Monitor started ringing and posting notifications in our Slack channels. At first, looking at the errors that were happening, it didn't seem like an obvious case. The error message that we were getting failed to execute remove child on node, blah, 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 blah. And the stack trace seemed to be pointing at a problem in React and the way the framework handled components in the DOM. But looking at our code base, we tried to replicate the issue. We couldn't do it. Um, it was not an obvious case. And since the amount of errors was pretty low, we decided to pause the investigation at this step and wait for more data to come in. But the monitors kept ringing. So we had to investigate further and troubleshoot this problem. Looking at individual events, um, something caught our attention. They were all coming from few countries in particular. So looking typically at the geomap on Datadog that groups events based on the geography, um, it became obvious that the location of our users had something to do with the problem. But we're talking about front end, right? Um, so I mean, what are our users seeing when the problem is happening. Since none of them had been vocal about the problem yet, could we learn something by re-watching their sessions? And here comes session replay. If you're not familiar with the product, um, it's, a, it's a solution that records 
the behavioral events like every swipe, every tap, every click happening on your mobile application or brother application so that you can afterwards replay the sessions of your users as if you were watching, as if you were looking over their shoulder. So we looked at some replay and suddenly it all made sense. If you're not, uh, if you haven't used that dog, I mean, you should know this, we don't translate your, our UI. And we're not here to debate whether it's a good or a bad thing, but rather to ask a question, why are we seeing things in Portuguese? It turns out that the way the brothers handle the translation, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, can break the React framework. Because, well, I won't go too much into detail, but uh, basically when the brother translates, it, it changes the structure of the DOM, and React cannot necessarily reconcile afterwards the elements on the page with the reference, uh, the reference that it has. In most cases, though it's not ideal, it's not fatal. But in some of them, where you have a piece of static text next to a dynamic one, the page can literally crash when users try to interact with a component that has been translated. And we're like any other companies out there, like how good of a user experience is it to provide this to your users, especially when you are monitoring an observability solution and they're probably using your product to troubleshoot their own problems. So the fix uh, was easy and just implementing span tags around uh, the dynamic text nodes uh, did the trick. So I guess we can happily claim that the problem is solved right now. Um, but I would like to leave you with three things in mind. The first one, telemetry does not only come from your backend services. Your front-end application produce data too. And actually, we've seen it together right now. There are problems, there are issues that are directly affecting your user experience that you can only encompass if you monitor your front-end uh, applications. Second, at Datadog, we have a suite of products to help you out there. Real user monitoring to collect telemetry, error tracking to turn individual events into a more meaningful story, session replay to make the debugging and troubleshooting workflow more visual, but we could quite uh, quote a bunch of others like our synthetic suite of products for API, web, and mobile applications. And third, as any other Datadog product, they all uh, connect, connect and correlate to each other to turn individual uh, telemetry into a complete story and make the single pane of glass that we like to talk about all the time real. Thank you very much. I hope it was insightful. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Mael. Um, I have to say, I always love those stories when we uh, fix things at Datadog, using Datadog, especially when we talk about things like real user monitoring or profiling, improving performance. We have many, many of those stories uh, internally. Um, so next up is Usman Niazzi. Um, he's the head of SRE at Danel, and he's going to share a fantastic story on how you have to think sometimes outside the box to get to a good solution. So welcome. Morning. When you get a message in the morning from a finance team telling you that we are missing thousands of transactions for the last few weeks and we have had no alerts or any indication from an observability perspective, you know it's not going to be a good day for you. And that is exactly what happened just over 18 months ago, which then led us to focus on making sure that we can account for every single transaction made on the tail, all the way to back-end ERP systems. What I will do is I'll go through that journey on what we went on, but first, a little bit about ourselves. We are UK's market leader in homeware. We have over 180 stores across the country. We get around 110K transactions daily. And we also have an e-commerce website which attracts around 2 million sessions daily. To support all of that, we build a lot of services in-house, but we also use third-party off-the- off-shelf 
solutions. To give you a flavor of some of the technologies that we use at Dunelm, and on top of that, just one thing to point out is that we are big users of serverless. In uh, December alone, we had around 2.5 billion Lambda invocations, just to give you an indication. But when it comes to our store till estate, we use an off-shelf solution provided by NACTA. We've been using NACTA now for quite a few years. It is a very comprehensive solution. But as with any off-the-shelf solutions, you are going to have some challenges. And one of those challenges is around monitoring, as you might have guessed. There are a few things that we have asked an actor to do and change, which will make it easier for us to monitor end-to-end. -end, but that will take a while to do. So we had to work around that. But what we'll do is give you a very brief overview of how transactions flow through our systems. So hang with me, it's very simple. In a store you can have multiple tills, up to 10. Each till will have a card reader, a cash drawer, and a printer to print your receipt. Once you have scanned all the items and are ready to pay, you can pay either by cash or you can pay by card. If you're paying by card, you will use a card reader, which will connect to the bank via payment acquirer, and they will take payment on our behalf. Once the payment is complete, transaction details are then sent to the printer, which will print the receipt for you, unless you have opted for e-receipt, in which case, the communication gets intercepted and instead of printing receipt, an email is sent out. Now the transaction is complete. It is sent to the store server. And the store will receive transactions from all tails in that store. It will process that transaction, send it over to stake manager. And the stake manager will receive transactions from all of the stores. It will, in turn, send that over to integration layer developed in-house on a serverless stack, which will then map it and send it over to SAP or ERP system. One thing to note, when a till sends a transaction to the store server, it's a send and forget mechanism. So it's not, there's no easy way of knowing if a transaction has actually been made, sent successfully or not. But for the rest of the estate, we can have a very good visibility of what is happening. We got Datadog agents on all the tails, on the store servers, and the Inector estate. We also have SQL scripts on tails, store servers, and the Nectar estate. And what this gives us is a visibility of are the transactions being processed successfully or not. Except for on tails. Because on a tail, it assumes every single transaction has been sent successfully, regardless. On top of that, there were some performance implications that meant we actually had to remove the script altogether. One funny thing about those SQL scripts, they were sending emails to individuals. Now, coming back to the incident, we're missing thousands of store transactions. There, were, there, was one main re there were multiple reasons, actually. But one of the main reasons was the changes that we had made to the store server, which meant some of the transactions were now failing to be processed. But also, we were seeing some transactions not even hitting the store server. One of the things that we did right away, instead of sending email, 
we started sending the metrics to Datadog, which then gives us a lot more flexibility on what we can do with that. But that still leaves the transactions which are not even hitting the store server. We already get settlement file from our payment acquirer. And all of the transactions are going through our integration layer. We build a new service. Now we can alert on any discrepancies. Good thing about this one is that it's not going to put any performance implications on the natural state itself and it's very much decoupled from it. But that still leaves, actually before that, there are a couple of downsides to using the settlement file that it can take up to seven days for all of the transactions to be settled. And the secondly, it's only accounting for card payments and not the cash payments. So we, while we wait for an actor to make the changes that we have asked them to do, we had to cover that gap. So we created a new service to handle that scenario. Now, every time a payment is taken on a till and the transaction details are being sent to the printer, we intercept that communication and send it to this service. We can monitor this service as well now and also replay those filled messages which means we can now start to alert on any discrepancies, even if a single transaction is missing. Again, very much decoupled from the nectar state itself, so no performance implications for it. This also gave us something else. Now we have a very accurate picture of the latency in terms of how long is taking for transactions to flow through all of that system, which we did not have before because of the some architectural constraints on the previous solution. Putting it all together, we already had a good visibility of a tail is down, store server is down, a Docker instance is not working, but now, we can see if there is any of the transactions not processing on the store server, on the EM, the central estate manager. But on top of that, we are starting to see, even if a single transaction fails to go through, latency is going up. And what this means for us is that we can now alert right away if there is an issue because all of the information is still on those devices, we can now actually investigate further, more thoroughly, and actually go after the root cause of the underlying issues, which was a challenge before. It could have taken a while before we knew where the issues were. By the time we get to it, if the server has restarted or the logs have gone, we won't store it for that long anyway. What we when we were working on this, we kind of, we did actually work very closely with an actor. We were open about our challenges and tried to understand the limitations that they have on their side and work with them to come up with a observability roadmap. And we did not shy away from making a service or building something of ourselves to collect the telemetry data that we need. At the same time, keeping in the mind the cost of building those services and using that to come up with a more realistic observability roadmap for this. One last thing before I finish. If any of you are wondering what happened to those thousands of missing transactions, we managed to recover every single one of those. But for some reason, the finance team was not as impressed as we were with that. 
I will be around. If you have any questions, please come and talk to me. Otherwise, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Susman. Um, I actually loved this story when we were doing dry runs because it involves a lot of the things that when you work mostly in an online environment, you don't think about, like physical world of tills, third party integrators, um, edge computing, because every single store has its own edge computing, and putting all together to make it work. So excellent, excellent story. Thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh, next up is Nils Munch, product manager at Diadoc. And he has a question for all of us. What is an anomaly? Hello, everyone. So I hope you still have a bit of energy for me because I have a question for you. Is this an anomaly? Yes? No? Maybe? So before we answer this, it's important to put this back in context. It's 2017, and we started to work on a watchdog, an AI engine, which would proactively detect anomalies without asking for users for any setup. And a big requirement we had was to protect against false positives, because there is nothing we hate more than being woken up in the middle of the night for nothing. So if we look back at the example with this in mind, the correct answer, and I heard it, is it depends. The first thing we can do is to look at the mathematical definition of an anomaly. We look at the history, we compute a baseline, we calculate the standard deviation, and check if the current values are within that baseline. Now, let's imagine if we zoom out from this graph, and we look at a longer time frame, and it looks like this. Then, it's, not, it's mathematically not an anomaly, it's just a regular spike happening frequently. But what if the historical data was flat, and we then had this spike? It would mathematically be an anomaly, but would you actually care? And that's the most critical question we had to answer when we developed the first version of Watchdog Alerts, because we had thousands of mathematically valid anomalies every single day. So there was something more to take into account here. And so if we go back to our example, let's imagine it's CPU. Would you wake someone up for this? Probably not, right? It goes from 10 to 30%. So for CPU, that's usually fine. You only start caring when it goes really up, like 80 or 90%. And moreover, it only lasted 10 minutes. So CPU going slightly up for 10 minutes is likely not something we would care about. Now note that we know here it only lasted 10 minutes because we're looking at it after the fact. It's not something you can predict while it's happening, right? But what if it's an error rate for a critical service? Then it's a different story, and you would likely start to care. So the first lesson we learned is that we care differently depending on the data we look at. And therefore, it's not just about mathematics and models anymore. It's about knowing what the underlying data represents and adjusting the protections you put in place based on this. Is the change big enough? or reaching a high enough value for us to care. For CPU type of data, we would likely add a lot of protections, making sure we reach high thresholds, while for error rates, we will likely be much more tolerant. And it's the same for how long the anomalies last. We would likely adjust the confidence interval based on what we're looking at. And in an ideal world, it would actually be a combination of both. If the change is large, we would accept a so shorter time frame before we start notifying people, but for a smaller change, we would likely like, uh, wait a longer time before we start raising it. Okay. Now that we've established the desired behavior, how do you train such a model? And historically, in Datadog, we've always done it in two steps. We start by using our own data to build a golden data set. We indeed internally have a lot of very different systems with very different requirements, so it's a very... Uh, diverse source 
of data to be able to train a model on. So with that data set, we train the first model and we look at the results. We then add a layer of protection based on our domain expertise and see how it goes. We iterate on this internally and once we're confident enough with the results, we start partnering with a selection of customers to see if our assumptions work for them as well. Once you get that working, you likely have some things you can roll out more widely and then you just, uh, you can start measuring performance of your model to make sure everything works well. And that was the first version of Watchdog Alerts. But then we ask ourselves, can we go even further than this? Because if we look back to our example, it would have happened as follows. The anomaly starts, let's say we detect it right away. You then wait for the context protection to kick in. Let's say it's an error rate. You still want to wait a few minutes to make sure it's not just a short blip. And so once you've reached that confidence interval, you start notifying on it. Now with this data, can we start predicting before point two that it's actually going to behave that way? Can we start raising this sooner while making sure we're not adding false positives? Because let's remember, it's the number one requirement. And for this, we are currently testing a new supervised model approach, and let's see how that works in more details. You start with a very simple trigger on close to real time, looking at the last few minutes of data. You then wait long enough, potentially hours, to have enough data and to see how it evolves, to then apply our previous logic with confidence so we can establish if it's actually a worthy anomaly or an unworthy one. You then teach the model about the outcome so it can start predicting with the very early data what is a worthy anomaly and what is not. You then start triggering the model from the, the simple triggers and you keep that training loop to make sure that quality doesn't degrade. And this approach is actually extremely useful when you lack label data and that your model is heavily dependent on the context on an ever-changing environment. And in our case, success will be measured uh, thanks to precision as we allow ourselves to miss a few anomalies as long as we quickly report true positives that users can rely on. And hopefully, we will be able to detect such an anomaly much quicker than before without degrading quality. Now, with everything that we've talked about, I wanted to give you one small exercise. Because the example I used was simple. It's a simple increase, it stays up and then goes down. Now, what about this one? Is it an anomaly? Multiple anomalies? And why? So when I let you think about it, I wanted to use that time to remind everyone to never assume that things are simple or that a model will figure out everything by itself. Every AI feature is a mix of mathematics, good training data, and domain expertise. And even something that might look as simple as detecting anomalies might be much more complex than what it seems. And if anomaly detection was among the first things that Datadog looked into, it did not stop there. We kept investing on getting more insights from the data and providing more value to users, whatever the technologies or systems were behind. And I wanted to leave you with one final thought as you start building AI into your own companies. Data scientists are not magicians. They do heavily need your domain expertise and knowledge to build quality features. Also, don't try to mimic human behavior too much. If you were to build an automated vacuum cleaner, you would probably not build a humanoid robot patting the vacuum, right? So always think about the best way to solve a problem, no matter what is the model or technology behind. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Nils. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that. Now I want a robot vacuum cleaner. Um, so I think it's, it's important to, to, to think about how we are trying to improve um, how we detect incident. So I think this is very cool uh, what uh, Nils' team is doing to, to get us there. 
Um, but next up is something that it's very, very important for everyone. I hope you learn here you something. Learn here some. uh, the next speaker is Leo Earl from, from Aviva. And we are going to be talking about sustainability, um, which I think is, is super critical these days. Welcome, Leo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Leo, and I'm joining you today at this wonderful uh, venue from Aviva. Um, and hopefully I'm going to take you through our sort of journey towards carbon net zero and some of the small steps we're taking in the platform engineering team. So Aviva has already put a pretty good stake in the ground, and it was actually the first major insurer worldwide to kind of aim for net zero by 2040. And this is a really encouraging sign for a business. But actually, I think we'd all probably agree, virtue signaling is very easy, and we probably all do it. But what we need to do really is to start delivering because you know, our environmental impact is quite significant. Thankfully, at Aviva, we, we, have, you know, we have started to make some traction on this. And actually, when we look at our 2019 scope one and scope two emissions, compared to now, we've actually reduced those by 50%, which is a really good start. But again, we need to deliver, and we need to deliver more. And I guess this is probably where the problem begins to really unfold, because the use of the cloud is really beginning to explode. The, the use of kind of digital technologies is really exploding. The ease of adoption, the disconnect kind of between the builders, the developers, and the billing, and I think given the fact that the environmental impact isn't always innately obvious, over time we really expect the level of waste in that kind of digital world to significantly increase. And I think one of the most worrying things here is if we look at that bottom bit there, which was a Gartner report, at least 30% of all cloud or digital consumption is probably waste. And in many ways for me, that, that's very, very, very scary. So I think, you know, as an, org as an organization of EVA and kind of as, as a sector and a group of people, I think we probably do need to do a bit more, to be honest. So a relatively dull colored slide, but um, thankfully at Aviva, we, we really are beginning to recognize this, and we actually have a formal project that's, that's funded, and we have people around it, and that project for us is called Operation Net Zero, and that's going to kind of span right the way across the business, covering everything from kind of procurement to scope one, scope two, travel, and of course IT, and I'm specifically involved in the IT work stream and more specifically involved in the cloud aspect of that. Thinking about some of our goals, and you know, maybe if you guys are kind of beginning to embark on, on some of these sustainability journeys in the cloud yourselves, one of the most important things or mantras that we kind of put forward initially was we really wanted to always remember that the greenest energy is the energy which we do not use. And that might seem like a bit of a funny statement because, of course, we're all pretty much pre-programmed and conditioned to, to assume, really, that green energy is clean energy. You know, lithium-driven cars are perfect for the world and all of those sorts of things. But inevitably, the greenest, cleanest, best thing to do is not to create it, not to build it, not to launch it if you're not going to use it. And actually, if you are going to use it, make sure it's right size. So that's kind of the thing that we've always put front and center. And without specifically kind of going through all of these here, I think one of the, one of the other most important things here is really to, to think about defining usage and defining waste. And again, that might seem like quite an obvious one, but you know, a GPU system with respect to waste may kind of look completely different to a memory optimized system in terms of waste. So I think you do need that kind of domain knowledge and expertise to really begin to define what waste and usage looks like in your organization, whether it be on-prem, hybrid, or in the cloud. And I think from there, you know, the chap before kind of mentioned it, this is where you can begin to do some of that anomalous de detection around waste and usage. And that will really drive some of those, you know, really good benefits for you. I think, you know, again, the big theme that we've kind of heard today is all about engagement. 
you know, and, and, and collaboration and all of those sorts of things. And it's fantastic to kind of see that echoed right the way throughout every one of the presentations today. All of this kind of sustainability stuff really is, it can be quite contentious. Tempers can flare slightly sometimes. But inevitably, there is a huge amount of intelligence in this sector. But I think everyone is going to have to kind of come together to share ideas and to collaborate to really improve that kind of footprint that we leave behind when we kind of launch these digital technologies. One of the most important things, of course, we want to do as part of this project is, is really to embed that sustainability consideration into our BA activities. And when we talk about BA activities, we're really talking about kind of change, design, projects, and all of those sorts of things. And I think that will mark this project either as a success or a failure if we manage to embed these sorts of considerations in, into our BAU change activities. And of course, one of the project's main goals has to be to reduce energy consumption and, dare I say, CO2 emissions as well. Unsurprisingly, at a Datadog conference around observability, I'm going to say it all starts with observability. Um, thankfully, over the last kind of couple of years, we've really began to partner with Datadog, and actually that additional observability has really begun to sort of pay dividends for us at Aviva. Some of the stuff we've really focused on in the project is, because we are such a, you know, a huge organization, tens of thousands of kind of EC2s and lambdas and, you know, God knows whatever else, scaling in, scaling out, being created, being deleted 24-7, one of the most important things we're really looking at is looking for that idle resource, doing that anomalous detection, looking for kind of right-sizing right variances, looking for persistent kind of unhealthy infrastructure that consumes proportionately much more power, um, looking for unbelievably duplicate infrastructure, because of, because of course we kind of operate a blue-green pattern, so actually it's not uncommon for kind of you know, unhealthy infrastructure to temporarily or even or I say persistently be left behind. And I think the other real important thing that we probably didn't really recognize two or three years ago was that non-production environments, at least in a huge organization, can be a bit like the Wild West. So we've always spent a lot of time kind of focusing on production quite rightly for our customers. We've got a lot of you know, monitoring, alerting, and people around that. But actually, the non-production environments are kind of developers going home and, you know, maybe spinning stuff up, creating stuff, destroying stuff, um, and dare I say, leaving a bit of waste behind. So we've, we have found so far the most benefit in the non-production environments. And actually, we're taking those engineering practices right the way through the non-production environments through to production. So we've really focused on those non-production environments. And I think one of the other, you know, real key key things here is to try and again, by way of putting all of this kind of sustainability into BAU activities, is to come up with some sensible kind of maturity impact assessment, whether it be for a platform, for a team, for a business unit, or even for an organization. You know, what constitutes kind of being sustainably green or getting a score of 10 or something like that? And actually, where is that gap analysis and what can we do to kind of transition to a more, you know, greener, sustainable approach? So having, you know, being objective around your own usage and being objective around where your gaps exist is probably the first point of call, really. This is a really good, you know, obvious example. And I'm very sorry to say that this was probably taken about a week ago and I thought, well, perfect. A, we've still got work to do. But B, I can use this as a screenshot. So these are actually standard APIs. They're in the non-production environments, but actually they're required, I'm going to say, 12 hours a day for people to do testing and, and to use them. And when we go back to the business and we say, hey, you know, do these APIs need to be on this? Of course they do. And we say, actually, these APIs should be serving, you know, should be responding with a 2xx, a 4xx, or a 5xx. And actually, when we look at them, we can see that they haven't had any requests in the last three weeks. And they say, are you joking? And we say, no, there's no requests going into these APIs. And we say, well, there's probably 42 EC2s backing onto this. 
So actually, can we turn this stuff off? Can we destroy it? And can we embed this low usage alerting into your team so that we can kind of you know, reset those baselines and power these things down much earlier? So we're really beginning to highlight some of this really obvious waste. This is a, a really interesting example. So again, back to that kind of anomalous detection that Nils mentioned a moment ago. One of the things that we really began to get some insight around about a year ago was, I'm going to say, ASG instance termination rates. And it became quite clear quite quickly that there are a lot of persistent, unhealthy ASGs or EC2s that were kind of sticking in that state for some time, I'm going to say it, weeks at a time. So this is the ELB health check marking a target as unhealthy, terminating it, restarting it six minutes later by way of an auto heal, and then terminating it again. And when you look at that sort of behavior, I'm going to say, across the environments, across the PPCs, there's at least 250,000 too many instances created per year just in our little environment, just in our area. And if we looked across the business, it's probably more like half a million. And when we look at the energy utilization of this persistent, unhealthy infrastructure, those systems spend the entirety of their lives, six minutes, building themselves, launching themselves, and then terminate, terminating themselves. What a tragic existence. But actually, the CPU and the memory utilization for that six minutes is massively higher compared to what it would be normally. And we can actually say that this is absolutely true waste. There's no benefit to these systems being up in this state whatsoever. And when we look at the cost correlations on top of this for this, this sort of behavior will stereotypically cost you between 500 and 1,000% more in the cloud. So actually, we need to get on top of this stuff much quicker than we ever have done before. And thankfully, we are beginning to do that. When we look at just one of these APIs in a bit more focus, we can see here that in 2023, I think, we launched 88,713 instances for this one API. And that's terrible, really, when I think about it because at least 80,000 of those were of no use whatsoever. And you can see that the cost was about $10,500, and the CPU utilization on average was about 25%, but there was no use to any of that stuff at all. It didn't serve any purpose. It was complete waste. And this is one API across thousands. But then we kind of get the blue bit at the top, and we look at how we've really began to interject some of this additional monitoring and alerting observability. And you can see that we've managed to reduce that excess unhealthy instance count by about 96%. We've reduced the cost by 85%, and we've also reduced the CPU utilization as well by about 65%. And I'm going to be honest and say, I think we've significantly increased the security posture as well, because of course, there's no better place to hide than in chaos. So actually, this has massive sort of benefits for the business. This is another really good example as well. So much of our estate really relies on, rightly or wrongly, Jenkins and kind of ADO automation to scale services in and out. And to be, to be frank and honest, I don't think we had enough observability monitoring alerting around those Jenkins jobs probably until about a year ago. And it wasn't until we really started tracking the status of, of our Jenkins pipelines and looking for, I'm going to say, result equals failure, so to speak, we began to notice that a lot of our downsize automation, which terminates our EC2s in the evening, was actually failing. And then when we did that root cause analysis, it was because we didn't necessarily have enough temporary storage, if you like, on the EBS volumes in the Jenkins work there on those boxes. So working with our wonderful cloud colleagues, who I think are probably here today, thank you guys, we managed to very quickly, easily resolve this, which meant that just in that one example, 
we're able to reduce our instance uptime hours across this particular space by at least 8,000 hours per month. And it reduced our AWS cost by about 1,000 pound a month just in this space as well. And we modeled and anticipated that this would save about 70 kilowatt hours of energy. So not an insignificant amount of benefit. This is a really, again, <laughs> another, another interesting one, at least for me. I came down today on the train, and I looked up, and the sky was beautifully blue, and I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And I kind of looked down, and I saw some wonderful pieces of water and buzzards and birds, and I thought, this is fantastic. It's great to be out of the office. It's great to be on the way to London. And then I looked right down beside the tracks, and I looked in the fields, and I thought, my God, the amount of waste we chuck, the amount of litter that we see everywhere now is incredible. And I'm going to be honest and say, are we beginning to do this in the cloud? Are we beginning to do this in our digital environments? I'm going to be honest and say, I think we probably are. So one of the big things that we're beginning to put in at Aviva as well is, I'm going to say, litter picking in the cloud. And we kind of do give you the, the grabby sticks and all of those sorts of things. We give you the dashboards. We give you the monitoring. We give you the alerting. And that enables teams really to begin to do their own litter picking in their own environments so that we can kind of see the duplication, we can see the excess unhealthy instance creation, we can see you know, right-sizing deviations, and we can kind of alert and flag this to teams and say, you may wish to consider to have a look at this. There might be potential for optimization. So that's one of the big things we're doing at the moment. It's kind of that daily waste tracking and daily litter picking in the cloud. Thankfully, you know, all of this hard work, um, all of this engagement, all of these dashboards and monitoring, alerting, and of course our investment in, in Datadog is really beginning to, dare I say, can, you know, give us something back, give the planet something back. We anticipate that just in our area, and there are many other areas across the Viva that are doing equally as good a work as we are, but just in our area, we anticipate that we've reduced our mon um, energy monthly energy usage by about three megawatt hours, which is equivalent to about 10 UK households, not an insignificant amount. And actually, we validated that this litter picking, this approach has reduced our AWS bill by about 350,000 pounds a year as well. So, you know, it's, it's not just kind of greenwashing. There is real tangible benefit to doing this stuff. Takeaways. It genuinely does start with observability. I think you do have to have a really decent granular view of your environments, particularly if you're at scale. And you do need to engage and collaborate and bring those domain experts into that conversation to begin to tease out what waste and what usage looks like. And I think from there, you begin to form some kind of sensible baselines around your sort of normative usage. And then you begin to alert on those anomalous kind of pieces of activity that you see. And I think from there, you'll drive some really good benefits. Definitely don't overlook the, the non-production environments. At least they were for us, you know, very beneficial. We've seen this theme today, support and grow a positive sustainability culture. It's been brilliant today to, to hear everyone say, you know, about collaboration. For me, I think this is probably the single most important thing we need to collaborate with each other. We need to engage with our suppliers. And we definitely need to do much more. There is so much intelligence and brain power in this sector. I'm almost certain we can do much better. The beauty of all of this, if kind of you know, those SLTs, those leaders kind of say, well, the devil are you doing the sustainability stuff, Leo, or anyone else, cost is generally a really good proxy for waste. So actually, if you're reducing waste, you're reducing cost. If, you, if you're generally reducing cost, you're probably reducing, you know, or reducing your environmental impact as well. So these are all really good things. The main thing for me, I think, and at least for Aviva, is you almost certainly need that, that kind of senior leadership um, buy-in. It's absolutely crucial, I think. We're very lucky that we have it right from the top with Amanda, right the way down to our director and our head of Santosh. These guys are really invested, as, you know, as, far, as far as I can tell, 
in driving much more sustainable outcomes. So I think, you know, leaders and such, hopefully you can get behind your employees to really drive some of this sustainability action because it's incredibly critical and I think it's incredibly valuable. And the other big one is, you know, and I'm sure there are many suppliers here today, we probably all need to work with our suppliers to bring them more to us and for us to go more to them because inevitably we all have to do better and of course that includes our suppliers as well. So it's all about collaboration. And that is it. Thank you very much. I should be around. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot, Lear. Um, I think one, one of the key things that I learned um, when I was watching the, this, this talk for the first time is that this project seems always very daunting to tackle, but it's incredible how much you can get with the low-hanging fruit. That there is a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can start with. And because, as Leo mentioned, cost is a proxy, you also see very quickly benefits that are very easy to sell uh, to, to leadership. So before we go to lunch, so this was our final talk, I'm going to welcome Jeremy again to the stage so to, for some final thoughts. Welcome. Thank you very much, Ara, and I appreciate I am standing in between you and, and lunch, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, so I, I've been at Datadog for a little while now. It's actually, it'll be seven years tomorrow. And some things have changed, of course. We've grown quite a bit, but a lot of things haven't. Uh, the, the technical precision, the humility, the collaboration, and the innovation. And I think those are the themes that really came out today. And, and we're really, really happy to, to be able to share these customer stories. So on that note, please give a huge round of applause for the customer speakers and product presenters today. Absolutely amazing job. Thank you. Uh, as I said at the beginning, really is something for everyone. And that trend will continue throughout the day. I do want to mention very, very briefly before we get going, uh, we do have Dash coming June 25th in New York City. If you haven't been to Dash, that is our, our global flagship conference. Thousands and thousands of your peers to network with. You know, 30 plus hands-on workshops, dozens and dozens of sessions. It's, it's going to be amazing. So really looking forward to that. Registration will open, uh, if not late this week, early next week. So do, do stay tuned there. A couple of reminders and notes. Uh, the product demos, the AWS game day, and the co-term battle will be live throughout the rest of the day during lunch and beyond. If you haven't participated in game day or co-term yet, please do so. Uh, we'll be giving away some prizes at about 4.45, so make sure you, you get in and play before then. All the PMs on stage will be available during the reception, which starts at 4. They'll be at one of the product stations, so if, if you wanted to learn more, or you want to grill uh, Nils about what an anomaly really is, uh, head to those stations and, and they're, of course, happy to, to chat. Uh, the on-call lounge, as a reminder, is available. And uh, so the workshops, if you haven't signed up for one, I believe they are at or near capacity. So a reminder that in this room will be Datadog on stateless uh, Kubernetes workloads uh, and ask an SRE with folks from Datadog SRE and w from Google. And on that bombshell, Enjoy your lunch. Thanks for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way to your seats. The program will begin shortly.
ladies and gentlemen, please make your way to your seats. The program will begin shortly. Thank you for coming to our session after lunch. Um, I, we will try to make it as energetic as possible. Um, we know after lunch is always a little bit difficult. Hope you all have your tea, your coffee, whatever you need. Um, this session is very, very important, very interesting for me, because um, I don't know if you know, but we do a series called Dadogon. Dadogon is a series of events that we do online, live, uh, but only online. Um, we've been doing like, I think, 30 sessions so far. And the idea of these sessions is that we invite engineers working every day on building Dadog itself, uh, to tell us about something that they're solving, like something that they're, they're using as a tech, how they're using it, maybe some incidents that we solved. And we basically go online live on those. And we take a lot of questions from the audience. We are doing live uh, online as well. So we are on the live stream. So if you're watching the live stream, we will take questions as well, both from the audience and here live in London. And also online. So this is the first time that we do one of these episodes with a live audience. Uh, we are here on uh, Dialog Summit in London. And if you want to watch this one or any of the previous episodes, they are all available on that website, dialogon.dialoghq.com. The episode today uh, is going to be about stateful workloads on Kubernetes. So my name is Sara Pulido. Um, I was here this morning, so maybe you already seen me. I'm a staff developer advocate at Dadoc and one of the co-hosts and co-organizers of Dadoc On. So if you have any feedback about the series or if you have any topics that you want us to cover on a future episode, please do reach out. Um, but the important people today here are Edward and Martin. Edward, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Hi, uh, my name's Edward. I've been at Datadog for about two years now. Uh, and I'm a manager on the team that uh, manages Postgres at the company. Martin? Yep, um, I'm Martin. I've been at Datadog um, a year and a half or so, and I'm an engineer on the team that operates Kafka. Good. 
Um, so usually what we do when we start uh, this episode is to talk a little bit about the scale that we run on. Uh, because some of the decisions on how we build Datadog are based on that scale. So Datadog currently has more than 27,000 customers. As you know, we are an observability platform, so we ingest telemetry data from all those customers. Uh, those adds up to millions of hosts um, that basically are translating into tens of trillions of data points that we have to ingest per day uh, and we have to process, so we are able to, to make use of those. And all of this um, we run on our Kubernetes infra. Um, Kubernetes, our infra in Kubernetes is, is very big. Um, we have thousands of clusters. Uh, many of those clusters have more than a thousand nodes each uh, that basically translate into hundreds of thousands of pods. And more importantly, we do this because we also run those on different public clouds. And we've been in Kubernetes like for about six, six years more or less now, maybe a little bit more, six, seven. Um, but when you talk about people running stateless applications in Kubernetes, like they're like, that's easy, that's how continuous work, they come and go. When, but when we move to stateful workloads, um, things get a little bit uh, trickier. So um, I would like to start this by asking um, both Edward and Martin uh, why running stateful workloads in Kubernetes has this concept of being a little bit scary. Yeah, basically we're just terrified of losing data. That's the, the one thing that we can't do when running these services is lose data. So uh, it's... Let's, let's not do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Data loss is terrifying. I think also um, Kubernetes took some time to be ready for um, stateful workloads. It initially launched without support for it. Um, and it's taken like, some time to shed that reputation as being like stateless only, but I think it's very much ready for stateful and has been for a long time now. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that that concept uh, has stayed a little bit on people's mind for a while, but uh, we will try to convince you that actually Kubernetes is now well ready for this. And we are going to do that uh, with two use cases. Um, not like we run more stateful workloads in Kubernetes, but obviously with Edward and Martin, we had to have the opportunity to talk about these two specific, Kafka and Postgres. So, just uh, let's start by uh, giving a little bit of overview of what is Kafka for people who may not know. Yeah, so um, Kafka, um, you could describe it as a um, distributed streaming platform. Um, it's basically like a way of like storing data in an ordered fashion and um, sort of building stuff to manipulate that. Um, so uh, what people really uh, like about Kafka is that it's, um, the, the bottom point here is supports high throughput and low latency workloads. Um, so the protocol is like really optimized for moving data like through Kafka with like minimal overhead. Um, and like another thing, obviously, is that um, it, it runs as a cluster, so it can offer like high durability and high availability. So you can build like a very reliable, high throughput streaming service on top of Kafka. Cool. Um, so Postgres, I know. Yeah. yeah, Postgres is a relational data store uh, based on SQL. It's open source. It's actually been around for something like 35 years, uh, so, so quite a while. Uh, it's a very mature product at this point. Um, it has a, a single leader architecture, which means any writes are going to that one leader at any moment. Uh, it's also possible to have multiple leaders, but that's uh, not something that we do and not something uh, that we'll talk about today. Uh, something that we really like about it is that it's uh, super extensible. So there's lots of extensions. There's a really rich ecosystem there. The protocol is very well described, um, which leads to a very rich uh, proxy ecosystem as well. And we'll see that that's one of the, the benefits that we're uh, using at Datadog. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, when, when I saw that it was Postgres was from 1989 for me, it was like, I thought it was like maybe 20 years ago, but not 35, definitely. <laughs> um, so, for those of you who are on the live stream, by the way, if you don't have to wait until the very end to put your questions in, you can use YouTube comments or LinkedIn comments, and we get there at the, at the end. We will make sure that we have enough time for questions at the very end. Um, so we are going to make those uh, examples, but uh, a lot of the things that we use at Dialog to run those stateful workloads um, is common. It's common infrastructure that we have. So 
let's start uh, by talking about those common things before we dive in into the specifics. Um, and one of the things that I want to make clear, I wanted to, we wanted to, when we were preparing this, is that many of the things are just normal Kubernetes abstractions. So for example, stateful sets and persistent volume claims. Um, Martin, do you want to give an overview? Yeah, definitely. So um, there are like, Kubernetes itself is very extensible and some people do this differently, but at Datadog, we're actually just heavily using the, the basic primitives. So um, the first thing for a stateful um, system on Kubernetes is to use a stateful set. So this is like deployments, um, a grouping of pods, but the key thing is that each pod is given a persistent identifier, um, like pod one, pod two, pod three here. Um, and this is helpful because it makes it easy to match like a volume to a pod. So what is a volume? So in Kubernetes, there's a concept of a persistent volume, which can actually mean like many different things. Um, it could be a volume, which is like the local disk on a Kubernetes node, or it could be a volume, which is like cloud block storage, for example, EBS. Um, all those different things could be PDs. Um, and there's also this concept of a PVC, a persistent volume claim, which kind of represents an application's request for storage. Um, it's kind of useful to decouple these things. Um, and the sort of workflow here is that the pod creates a PVC which gets bound to some persistent volume which meets its requirements. Um, and it can sort of use that. And um, yeah, we'll see some examples of that in a moment. Um, yeah, so another thing uh, that uh, we're using heavily at Datadog is um, this concept of a node group. Um, so this is a custom resource um, that um, Datadog uses internally. Um, and what it basically is is an abstraction over an auto-scaling group on like, the various cloud providers. One of the things that we use Kubernetes for is an abstraction over the different cloud providers. So this is really helpful. Um, and this kind of like, manages like, the sort of like, all the auto-scaling that you'd want, like nodes just come when you ask for them. It's really nice. We don't have to think about it too much. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe an uh, example of how we sort of use these. Um, so you can see here that um, we have uh, an example where we have like an instance type, so m6g.xlarge. Um, as someone on the Kafka team, like I'm probably like, I want a machine which has got good enough CPU, a lot of throughput, and a lot of storage. Um, so I might like look through the sort of like what's available and be like, okay, m6g.xlarge, that's got decent CPU, I'll take that. Um, the other sort of key thing is that we can say how much storage we need. Um, and uh, the, the useful thing here is that like this abstraction works in a different way over different providers. So we can just basically see our requirements for machines. This allows us to do things like T-shirt sizing, where we can like have a notion of like what is a medium-sized machine on different cloud providers, um, and uh, yeah, we can yeah sort of say exactly what we need in terms of storage. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so I, I think it's it's very interesting to see that uh, one of the things that that made us switch to Kubernetes was that it's very extensible through the it's API. Everything is API driven, so you're able to to do this custom resources that allow you to build abstractions that suit you, your use case. Um, so for, for PVs, um, you, you're able to, to actually have them as local storage in the node, and we do that, uh, but we also do remote storage. So uh, what are those two differences between one and the other? Yeah, so I think this is like quite a sort of like fundamental thing, uh, distinction, but um, there's a lot of like, pros and cons and they kind of come in pairs. So um, the first one is like local storage can be cheaper. Um, so certainly like uh, some cloud block storage has a reputation as being expensive and it probably is if you're storing a lot of data on it. Um, but I say can be here because it really depends on the workload. Um, smaller storage footprint things might actually find remote storage cheaper in some cases. Um, the big one, I think, is um, like the failure modes. Like if you're using local storage, there's obviously like no network between you and the disk, which is great. Um, on remote storage, like you have to think about the cases like what happens if I just the disk becomes unavailable. Um, it's more frequent. Um, another thing that Edward will go into more detail on, but uh, we sort of regularly re replace the nodes by which I mean Kubernetes nodes, and if you're using um, the local storage on that Kubernetes node, then you have to somehow get the data back when you replace it. 
Um, whereas with uh, volumes, you can just reattach them. Like a remote storage volume, you can reattach to a new machine, and that's um, very nice. Uh, kind of like the extreme case of this previous point is like what happens if you lose all Kubernetes nodes in a cluster? Um, it can happen. Um, so the sort of um, there's a sort of no separation of failure domains with local storage. Like you lose all your nodes, you lose all your disks. That's really bad. Uh, if you've got remote storage, then these are different problems, and you can sort of reattach all your storage to the new cluster, so you're only worried about availability in that case. Um, finally, um, it's a bit more flexible having these sort of decoupled storage and compute things. Uh, with local storage, there's a pretty limited list of VMs that you can actually use in each provider, whereas if you're using remote storage, you can really be like, um, I don't know, you've got much more options when it comes to like, saying, I want this amount of CPU, this amount of storage. And finally, performance, which I put a kind of question mark next to because I think it kind of like um, remote storage again has a reputation as being less performant. But uh, one, I think it has improved a lot, um, so that that might not be the case anymore. And another thing is like you really need to benchmark it. Um, Kafka uses disks in a very specific way, which means that uh, this isn't really much of a, an issue for us. But it could be different for different workloads. So I think you just need to benchmark really. Great. Um, we've, we've talked about node replacement and, and how it is different from local and, and remote storage. Uh, but at Datadog, we don't do this just when it fails. We do actually, we have something called node lifecycle automation that replaces uh, nodes that are older than an amount of days. Uh, that means that as size, we are replacing thousands of nodes each day. And that, that has some implications for, for stateful teams, like, like Postgres, I guess. Yep. Yeah, for, for all the teams. So as usually, if you're, running your, uh, if you're running in the cloud, if you're running in a cloud, you're going to be used to nodes coming and going. So if you run for long enough, maybe like a node will fail every couple of days or every couple of weeks or something like that. Um, the benefit of node lifecycle automation is that it causes those nodes to fail every couple hours, maybe. Um, so you get, you really get good at handling a node failure. Um, and so for, for that, it causes, there's, there's two cases that we have to deal with. There's this case of a node failing when we didn't plan for it. This is like the node crashing, the node getting replaced by the, the cloud provider. Um, we don't get any notice on that. So kind of like from one moment to the next, the node is gone. Um, and then the thing that we care about at that point is how long is it going to take before we have a replacement node up and running? Um, and that node is really part of the cluster and serving requests. Um, and with local storage, uh, the, the, the big factor that makes, makes that difference is going to be how long it takes to get the data back onto the node. Um, so the way, one of the ways that we optimize that for, for Postgres is by just backing up the data very often to cloud blob storage. And then when the replacement node comes back, uh, pulling that back up back onto the node. But like Martin mentioned, um, that takes time. You know, you're copying data back and forth. Um, so if you can do this, if you have remote storage, that's obviously going to be quicker. Then you can just reattach the volume. Um, if you're using NLA, um, the automation will actually tell you, hey, I would like to replace this node. Um, can you please prepare it so, that, um, so I can have it? Um, and then what we do in those callbacks would be something like triggering a leader election um, to, to make sure that, that node isn't the leader of the cluster at that moment. Uh, maybe we trigger a backup as well so that we make sure that the, the data and the backup is as fresh as possible. Um, and then we tell the automation, yep, I'm done. And then we can kind of swap the node really quickly. And um, kind of with that, with that, uh, with that notice, then the amount of time where the node is actually, or where the cluster is impacted by the node replacement is super short. Uh, so, and which is good, because we do it hundreds and hundreds of times per day. So you have to better get your things together. Um, so yeah, so for example, no, no life cycle automation is something that our compute team offers. Um, so all of the thing, many of the things that you do are based on the things that the compute team offers uh, to, to the different teams. Um, and one of the latest things that they, they've been working on is this concept of regional versus zonal clusters. Um, if you, yeah. 
can go with it. So, so here we see kind of like a, an idealized, simple version of our application. It's, it's running in all the availability zones. Most of the cloud providers have these availability zones. Like Martin mentioned, these are our failure domains. So you wouldn't want a, a failure to go beyond one of the availability zones. Um, and if we drop our application into a Kubernetes cluster, you can see this Kubernetes cluster kind of like it stretches across multiple availability zones, which should be kind of like the first indication, like eh, maybe that's not good. Um, so you can imagine here if something happened in our Kubernetes control plane, um, like Martin mentioned, maybe all maybe it kills all of the nodes in the cluster. Um, and if our app is deployed in this cluster, that means that our app has been killed across the entire all three availability zones. If we're using local storage. That basically means data loss, um, which means a lack of availability, lack of durability. This is kind of like the, the worst case scenario. Um, so the way we avoid this is uh, something called zonal clusters. Uh, you can see from our app perspective, it's, it looks the same. Like each application is running inside a single availability zone, but the, the world around it is kind of different now. Uh, so each Kubernetes cluster um, exists in one zone and each zone has one Kubernetes cluster. Um, and you can also see kind of visually that nothing's crossing these dashed lines anymore, uh, which means that if the control plane dies in this case, um, it's gonna kill all of the nodes in that Kubernetes cluster, um, which kills one of our application pods, uh, but we've still got uh, you know, the rest of the pods running there. And uh, because we design our application for an availability zone disappearing, um, we've still got our application, which is continuing to serve traffic and no data loss, maybe like an availability blip, but that's it. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so all of that, it was a little bit of introduction of all the common base for any application at Dadoc that we have, but uh, now I'm going to pass the clicker to Martin, who is going to go a little bit deeper into the specifics of Kafka. Um, yeah, so first, um, a little bit of history, I guess. Um, Kafka uh, was probably, this is rough for the earlier history, um, but Kafka was probably being used at Datadog for about 10 years. Um, and I'd say it was sort of like very widely used by pretty much everyone since 2017. Um, and yeah, so we had the Kubernetes migration, um, and I'd say by like 2019, like, there's a lot of like, um, big applications using Kafka and Kubernetes at Datadog. And I say the story since then has mostly just been like increase in scale. Um, so we're sort of like several hundred clusters. Um, we uh, have to, to like have lots of like good automation at that sort of scale, like um, so, sort of auto scale and failure, failure handling. That's been a lot of what we're working on there. Um, but um, sort of um, more recently, um, we've been uh, begun adopting like tiered and remote storage. So I'll talk about these more later on, but this is more about like decoupling the compute and storage that we mentioned briefly earlier on. Um, so yeah, if you're uh, running um, a Kafka setup anywhere, well, like modern Kafka, you can use um, Craft, but we're still using Zookeeper backed clusters in most cases. So you need a Kafka cluster and a Zookeeper cluster. Um, and we're using just basic stateful sets for both of these, um, the Kafka cluster storing some metadata in the Zookeeper cluster. Um, I uh, mentioned the node groups earlier on, and we sort of have like dedicated node groups for Kafka. Uh, we have a requirements like what's a like medium-sized machine on AWS, for example, and the Kafka cluster, uh, as Paul's right, it will request node from this node group, and they'll just magically appear, which is very nice. Um, another thing that I won't talk about much, um, but it's re actually really important, is that uh, every cluster uh, at uh, Datadog has these like tool deployments alongside, which is basically automating a lot of the operations. Um, so things like auto scaling, which uh, actually interacts back with the, the node groups and the auto scaling for the underlying node groups, um, and various like operational and resource management APIs. Um, so I'd like to go into some detail about how exactly we uh, get persistent volumes for our Kafka brokers. Um, so Kafka brokers are like the stateful part in Kafka. This is where the, the data is stored. Um, so you're going to need a volume for a broker pod. Um, and we're just using the sort of um, basic uh, like stateful set ideas here. So um, first off, we have a node affinity, which says um, this node 
must be scheduled on Kafka medium node group. If it's, uh, that node group's not big enough, the node will automatically be added. But um, once it's there, um, the pod is scheduled on the node. And the persistent volume claim will bind to the persistent volume on the node. Um, so uh, yeah, one thing to like, sort of notice here is that the persistent volume claim is like related to the name of the broker pod. That's not a coincidence. Like that's um, actually key uh, to making sure that this uh, like identity survives pod restarts, for example. Cool. Um, so once our broker pod is uh, on the uh, the node and is. Um, persistent volume claim is bound to the persistent volume, uh, the broker can start running and it can join the Kafka cluster. And when it's joining a Kafka cluster, it'll need um, a broker ID, which is like how the cluster is going to refer to that. And again, this is also derived from the sort of pod name, which is a stable identifier in a stateful set. Uh, so here, like broker ID might be zero if the broker pod was ordinal zero in the stateful set. So. This setup, which is what we sort of historically used, um, and uh, has like a, like a couple of like really nice properties. So like one is that like node replacement is completely automatic. Um, so if your node fails, like the persistent volume is going to go. So the persistent volume is deleted. PVC becomes unbound. The pod is just automatically scheduled on a different node in the same node group. And we go through the same process. Um, and now the broker pod enters the cluster. Um, it doesn't have any data at this point, but Kafka replication will just automatically mean that it catches up data from its peers. So that's nice and automatic. And somewhat related, like for a roll and restart, where the node stays, but the, just the pod is restarted, um, we know because the persistent volume claim is bound to the persistent volume on this node, the broker is just automatically going to get rescheduled there. And all you have to do is like a very small amount of catch up from its peers to catch the data that it missed while it was down. So roll restarts could be pretty fast. Um, there are downsides though. Um, so the big one is uh, sort of like the, the time it takes to replace a node. Um, so we mentioned that um, it's having to like replicate data from its peers. Um, this can take like many hours in our uh, sort of like biggest production clusters. We've got two examples here, two node replacements. It takes about 10 hours in total. Um, so yeah, that's uh, not ideal. Um, another thing that uh, you have to be very careful about, um, so in, in most cases, this happens automatically. Um, a broker fails, the Kafka cluster detects it, it kicks it out. When that broker re-enters, you know, it's just a follower for everything. It doesn't have any leadership responsibilities, and that's all fine. Um, there are definitely some like strange edge cases, uh, which we sort of find in chaos testing environments, where this Kafka doesn't detect a failure and doesn't successfully demote from leadership. So you have to be very careful that um, this uh, doesn't uh, happen, because if the broker enters the cluster as a leader with empty disk, then the authoritative state of the data is that there is none, um, and you've uh, got data loss. So um, yeah, you need to explicitly guard against that potential edge case in Kafka. Um, finally, there's the cost aspect. So um, we are sort of forced to use storage optimized machines on the cloud providers because um, we need enough disk to cover like however much retention we need, but. 99% of the time, like our applications are only reading the last few seconds worth of data from Kafka. So it's very wasteful to spend so much money on this local disks that you're barely using unless there's like some instant where you need to do a backfill. So one of the things that um, we've been like adopting to address this is uh, tiered storage. So um, the sort of idea here is, um, well, this, this old historical data that you're not reading so much, why don't you put it somewhere cheaper? Um, so that's exactly uh, what tiered storage is. It's um, a relatively new feature in Kafka itself, but um, there have been sort of implementations of this in various forks over the recent times. Um, you keep your sort of like hot data, like could be like say two hours worth or p possibly even less if, you're, if you want, uh, on your local SSDs and the historical data you put in S3. And there's like plugins for different cloud providers, so you can use this cross cloud. And it's not a big change to Kafka. It's basically um, you know, just more performance tuning. But API-wise, there's, there's nothing to change. 
So yeah, the, the major benefit is sort of improved operations, like these node replacements, which I said uh, could take hours and become much faster um, if you have most of the data in S3, because the data that's in S3, you don't have to replicate. It's just, you just pick it up as you need it. And you have like opportunities for cost savings by like aligning the usage um, with, like, yeah, this, this aligns more of the usage patterns where this like, old data is rarely read. And finally, even just from like a feature point of view, like we'd have users who want to set like really long retention, like maybe a week, um, but that was impractical before because uh, just the storage costs would um, be astronomical. Uh, but now we can do that. It's relatively cheap to just increase the retention in S3. So here's a, a quick graph um, of a sort of faster node replacement. This is sort of like a two hours down to 25 minutes once you start using tiered storage. Uh, this is from our stage environment, so the amount of data is uh, not actually all that huge compared to some of our production ones, where the um, improvements would actually be probably bigger. Um, okay, nothing's ever free, I guess. So um, there are new failure modes. Uh, one is uh, cloud storage can go down. It's rare, but it could in theory happen. Um, and if that does happen, then you've got some problems where you can't upload files, so you're probably filling up local disks. You've probably got a nasty incident, um, so you do need a mitigation strategy for that. Another thing is, um, so you need to be sure that um, tiered storage traffic is background traffic, because like serving your customers' region rights is always the most important part. Um, so yeah, th this needs to be managed somehow, so you need some sort of throttling mechanism. And finally, like, in the rare cases where you do need to read historical data, like, uh, this is by design going to be slower in this approach, but you do need to, like, you don't want it to be terrible, so there's like, some work to do to tune this to make it reasonably performant. Um, so, yeah, so that's a big thing that we've been working on. There's a couple other things which like, touch with our uh, interactions with Kubernetes right now. Um, so, we're also sort of evaluating remote storage. So we're, we're using this in some cases for smaller workloads already. Um, but for larger workloads, it only really becomes an option once you're using tiered storage for like, cost reasons. You can't store um, very large amounts of data in, say, EBS um, without it being too costly. But the two together um, sort of might be feasible. Um, and this kind of like, uh, opens up a bunch of the benefits you said about using remote disks versus local disks. Um, Another thing is sort of multi-tenancy. So um, at, uh, like you have kind of two options for this. When you're running Kubernetes, you can do multi-tenancy at the Kubernetes level. Many Kafka brokers on the same node. Um, we're currently only using one because we're using local disk. Uh, although we're probably going to go the opposite way and do multi-tenancy at the Kafka level instead, but that's still work in progress. Um, finally, um, we have. Uh, we're like, regularly doing chaos testing, so we're using Chaos Controller, which is um, something that um, Datadog has uh, open sourced, I believe, for like, just injecting faults in your like, Kafka clusters all the time. So we're doing that regularly and um, looking at like, large scale fail failures like an AZ loss or a Kate's cluster loss and seeing if we are at least reasonably resilient for those. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Cool. Um, if you're interested, historically have we been running Kafka in Kubernetes for a while. Uh, actually, our first ever Diadogon episode was fully on Kafka um, back in 2020. The team was already running in Kubernetes. And I think it's very interesting that we got both Martin and Edward uh, to see the difference in, in maturity. Because uh, as, as Martin mentioned, uh, Diadoc has been running Kafka in Kubernetes almost from the very beginning. Uh, Postgres, as we will see in Edward's section, it's a little bit different. They're, they're newer to, to in this Kubernetes journey. Uh, so Edward is going to take it away from here and, and tell us about Postgres. And Postgres. Thanks. So uh, we've had Postgres at Datadog uh, basically since the beginning. So 2010, we were running Postgres inside of virtual machines on EC2 at that point. Um, and that worked for us pretty well for a long time. Basically a decade we were running with that, that kind of uh, that architecture. Uh, Martin mentioned uh, 2019, we started moving everything from virtual machines into Kubernetes. Uh, in 2021, we were, were also wanting to move out of virtual machines but we didn't quite uh, trust that we could run 
this stateful workload inside of Kubernetes at that time. So the move that we made was into cloud-managed data stores, so RDS or Cloud SQL, something like that. Um, pretty quickly, we realized that uh, instead of kind of not having to deal with any of the, of the stack other than Postgres, we actually had to deal with a bunch of different stacks. So kind of each one of these cloud-managed uh, Postgres offerings had their rough edges. Um, and now we had to be an expert at all of those rough edges. Um, so pretty quickly after we saw that, we started uh, planning our move into Kubernetes. So 2022, we had our first clusters running on local storage in Kubernetes. Um, and now in the past year, we've been exploring using remote storage uh, on Kubernetes for similar reasons that we'll talk about. So why did we want to do it on Kubernetes? Um, like we talked about uh, a couple of times, um, Datadog's pretty good at Kubernetes in the meantime. It's been five, six years, so uh, we know how to do that well. Um, having Kubernetes as an abstraction is really nice. You know, we don't have to deal with all the stuff further down in the stack. Um, we just talk, you know, stateful sets and, and uh, persistent volumes and that kind of stuff. Um, being able to have consistent operations across all of the cloud providers is super nice. You know, just having to do one type of operation and do it wherever you want, um, really great. And the flexibility is nice. Um, we have this, we can set the settings we want. We can use the extensions we want. We can use the versions we want. Uh, it's all on us. Um, the downsides are it's all on us. Um, so we have to do these operations, um, and I'll mention some of those in a bit. Um, so here's our architecture, um, and I'll talk through each individual piece. Um, so in the middle, this is kind of like the pure Postgres part of it. Um, you see, like I mentioned, there's a single leader, the current leader. We have a bunch of warm standbys, one of those in each availability zone, um, and those are uh, kept up to date with replication, so streaming replication to them. In addition, we've got uh, read-only replica pools um, that are also kept up to date with replication, streaming replication. Um, we only have those for clusters that are big enough to need it. Um, if possible, we can uh, sometimes just work with a single leader. Um, we also use uh, Zookeeper to store uh, metadata about the cluster. Um, that's uh, done using a package called Patroni, which stores uh, cluster state and cluster configuration into a, a pluggable configuration store, in our case, it's Zookeeper. Uh, so for each Postgres cluster, we have a, a Postgres cluster and a Zookeeper cluster that we're, that we're uh, running. Um, for backups, we put um, both kind of full data, full cluster backups and write-ahead logs into cloud blob storage for Postgres and also for Zookeeper. Um, yeah, and then for the query side of things, uh, we've got a proxy in front of all of these leaders and warm standbys. Uh, the way this works is that Petroni uh, gives a, a health check API to the proxy so all of these leaders and warm standbys exist in a single backend pool of the proxy, but only one of them is healthy at a single time. Um, so, and that's the one that requ receives requests from the application through the proxy. Uh, on the read side, um, we also have a proxy in front of them. Uh, the health check on that is done using uh, the replication lag. So if a read replica is too far behind the leader, then it'll get pulled out of the, out of the backend pool um, until it gets a chance to catch up. Yeah, so that's the, the, the whole architecture. Uh, each one of these white boxes is a Kubernetes pod. Uh, so let's dig into what a, a Postgres pod looks like. Um, so inside of a single pod, uh, we've got a single container. Inside of that single container, there are th uh, a bunch of processes. Um, so the first process is the Postgres uh, Postmaster. This is the part that actually opens up a socket and receives connections from uh, the applications. Um, it hands off those connections to a background uh, processor. That, uh, that processes it. Uh, there's a bunch of other workers like um, auto vacuum worker, uh, wall sending, uh, stats collecting. All these processes are running in the container as well. Um, and then one more process is the Petroni process. What this is doing is kind of continually taking the cluster state and reflecting it into the Zookeeper cluster um, and checking to make sure that all of the nodes in the cluster are still accessible. If it notices anything is up in the cluster, then it triggers a leader election. Um, it also has this HTTP, HTTP API where it uh, makes this status available to the proxy. So we've got the pods. Let's kind of drop them down onto some nodes. Um, and so this slide tells us um, how we distribute nodes, 
how we distribute the pods in the nodes in our clusters. There are two dimensions here. On the left-hand side, you see this uh, local and remote storage. Uh, this is similar to what Martin talked about. Um, on the top, you've got dedicated and, and shared nodes. Um, and the kind of the, the architecture that we used when we first started was running on dedicated nodes with local storage. Uh, we thought this was gonna be the most uh, cost efficient as well as the most performant. Uh, yeah, that's not necessarily always the case. Um, the way that, we've that we're moving now is to have, to use remote storage almost in all cases if the cluster supports it, um, and to use um, usually dedicated nodes. Uh, for smaller clusters, we can, uh, we can afford to, to pack multiple clusters onto a single node, or even mix it up with uh, completely unrelated data stores. Um, before before you, you go into operations, I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, or clarify for the audience, Patroni is an open source project that, uh, yes. yep. that allow you to, to run. Yeah, Patroni is an open source project. Uh, it's uh, how you do high availability uh, with Postgres. There are other ways probably, but uh, this is the one that we use and like. Uh, we like it so much, we've created some open source um, extensions for it. Uh, we've pushed back uh, a couple patches. Um, yeah, it's a great project. Cool. Yeah. yeah, so let's talk a bit about uh, some of these operations that we have the, uh, the joy to be able to run on our cluster. Uh, backups is a really common one. Um, so. We run, so we're pushing backups, and so these are full data backups of, of the data in the cluster, as well as write-ahead logs into cloud blob storage. Um, and the frequency that we, that we do those backups and, and pushing the walls is a, is a tunable knob that we can use to, uh, to determine how fast uh, a, a replacement node comes back when it's, after it's crashed. Uh, so if you're doing them very often, uh, the data is gonna be super fresh in the backup and a node is gonna be able to come up pretty quickly once, um, once it comes back. Um, the downside of that is that you're doing a lot of processing and doing backups and doing checkpoints on the right head logs, um, which is CPU that you're using and not um, using to serve requests to your users. So that's kind of the, the trade-off there. Um, some other uh, cluster lifecycle operations that we do, uh, major version upgrades, those are on us to do now. Um, migrations to Kubernetes, um, something I didn't mention back in this timeline view is that none of those points are actually like fixed points in time. They're all like smeared over years. Um, and so these migrations into Kubernetes from cloud managed storage is also something that's ongoing. Um, and then there's also table split outs. So if a, if a, if a database ever grows bigger than it should be, so, um, and we wanna pull some tables out and put them in their own database, um, that would be this table split out case. Um, and all three of these operations are driven using uh, what we call uh, blue-green deployments. So, and for example, uh, a major version upgrade would be we take the cluster, we duplicate it, we upgrade the new cluster, um, we redirect traffic to the new cluster, and then we decommission the old one. Uh, and that's how we do all of these kind of operations. So that's basically, that's the state as it is right now. That's what we have running uh, for the most part in Datadog in production. Um, the future that we see at, um, for Postgres is improving this proxy story. So we have a, a proxy, I mentioned it a couple times, it's in front of the leaders, it's in front of the replicas, it's used to uh, redirect traffic when doing these blue-green deployments. Um, in addition, we have PG Bouncer, a common um, uh, connection pool. Um, so all these are proxies, um, and they're all different softwares, uh, different services that we have to run, that we have to know, that we have to understand. Um, so we see some real benefits to our architecture by replacing all of these with a single proxy that, uh, that we've written, um, and kind of getting that whole proxy behavior, as well as some, some interesting uh, features as well, as, um, such as, uh, Authentication, uh, really nice. We don't have to deal with passwords anymore, which is amazing. Um, automatic traffic routing, only sending selects to the, re to, um, to the read replicas, everything else going to the leader. Integrated caching, uh, we're, we're data dogs, so we want uh, best of class observability inside this proxy. Um, so yeah, that's what we're working on now. Um, and this is where we see the, the big benefit coming to our application uh, developers by having this nice proxy. Cool, thanks. Thanks a lot, Edward. Um, so we are going to, like, we've covered a lot. Things that are common, things that are specific. Um, we are going to take questions just after doing a little bit of summary of some of the takeaways. So if you, again, if you're in the live stream, please put a comment on YouTube or LinkedIn, 
um, and we will be answering your questions. If you're here at that Oxford Summit in London, we will pass a mic uh, around for questions. So we want really to make this as conversational as possible going now in the, past, in the next 15 minutes. So I will pass the, this to Martin to, to, for some takeaways. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so I think the first one is like Kubernetes is definitely data ready. Um, I'd say it has been for a long time. Um, but you do need to understand how things work. You need to understand the edge cases, and it might be specific to your data store as well. Uh, so we talked a lot about what storage you use. Um, local storage is cheaper, um, or at least it, it can be cheaper. Uh, but uh, it will require sort of more operations overhead. So there might be a benefit to like offload and storage if you can. Um, for remote storage, for example. Um, something that I think is important to keep in mind is that Kubernetes itself is a failure domain. Like you can lose an entire Kubernetes cluster. Um, so yeah, what happens in that case is something you like need to keep in mind. Um, and finally, like uh, we at Datadog are very lucky. Uh, we've got like a, a big compute team who provide a lot of useful abstractions, a lot of useful multi-cloud abstractions. So yeah, we were able to rely on a lot of common tool and from or a Kubernetes team, uh, which is yeah, really helpful. Yes, good. Um, so thank you. We are going to take it now for questions. Thanks, Edward and Martin. That was very, very insightful. Um, so if we have any questions from the audience. So anyone? So I have a question so why people think about questions. Um, one of, one of the things that uh, people do with the stateful sets in general, I, anything in, the, in Kubernetes, but there are especially on things that require a lot of operations, like a stateful sets, uh, people rely a lot on, on open source operators that people have built and trying to mimic this expertise of how to do all these operations in, in something that is more or less automatic. Um, any reason why or why not would you use an operator? Yeah, when we, when we were first planning our migration into Kubernetes, we evaluated all of the, the possible operators out there. There's a bunch of really nice ones. Um, they all had uh, a couple things that didn't make them fit either, either our scale or our particular, um, some of the things that we use. Um, we use replica groups, groups of read replicas that wasn't available in some of the, re some of the operators. Um, so there was always something that, that didn't fit. Um, the multi-cloud aspect or the multi-cluster aspect, if like these zonal clusters, could also be uh, something that I think very few operators support out of the box. Um, so in the end, we just wanted to own, if we were gonna own everything, we wanted to really like own it all. Really own it. Um, what about Kafka? Yeah, so I'd say in Kafka's case, um, since we started so early, it probably wasn't so much of an option at the time. Like now there are some very nice Kafka operators, for example, StreamT, uh, out there in open source. Um, I think given that we've been doing this for so long now, like migrating to StreamT, it's not uh, particularly appealing for us because we've built a lot of the things ourselves. And a lot of the challenges that we're facing now are like, um, because we have so many clusters and we need to coordinate across clusters and also because um, our Kafka clusters are not necessarily scoped to a single Kate's cluster as well. So some of these things that don't fit in the operators now, but I think a few years ago we might have thought about things differently, but where we're at now I don't think it makes much sense. Good. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, you talk about the tiered class, the tiered storage. Does that um, span across things like um, FSX and Glacier? And um, yeah, so for for now, um, we're just using basic S3. Um, but I think there is um, an option to. It's it's completely pluggable, so you you can actually so from Kafka, you can say like what storage you want to send it to, and you like develop a plugin to put it there. So for tiers within, sorry? You can write exclusion rules and... Yeah, yeah, you, you, it's basically completely pluggable as long as you code to the interface for how files go from Kafka to where you want them to go. Yeah. Over there. Um. 
It sounds like multi-cloud is a huge advantage of uh, this approach with Kafka and Postgres. For an organization that's single cloud, do you think it's still an approach that could make sense? Very good question. Yeah, totally. yeah I, I think it would. Um, I think probably running your own Kubernetes clusters then doesn't make that kind of sense. But like the 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 basis that um, that Kubernetes provides um, is just a really nice abstraction. Um, at, at previous companies, I've used it as to not get um, tied down to a single cloud provider, um, to have that be like your, your abstraction. Um, so I totally think it, it could still be valid um, if you're already doing Kubernetes. I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't start doing Kubernetes for stateful stuff, necessarily. Yes. Um, yeah, I, th I think the, that abstraction layer, when you're multi-cloud, is even better. But I think it's even worth if you, again, if you already have some expertise into, into Kubernetes. Um, any other questions uh, over there? Claire? Um, you mentioned at points you had some stateful workloads that was partly on VMs and partly on Kubernetes. Were there any challenges when you were like halfway through and some was on VMs and some was on K8s? Um, so we didn't have any databases that were spread across uh, VMs and Kubernetes. So when we decided to make that change, it was kind of like a, um, an atomic change for a single database. Um, we did it for some big databases, so that atomic change was still a big operation, um, but we didn't really spread across, uh, across the two. No. Yeah. Um, we actually have a question from, from the live stream. So um, talking about Sonal clusters, uh, making sure they're keeping them in sync, how, how do you manage all that network traffic? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, so I guess there, there's two aspects to that. Like, um, so what one is like configuration. So if you're um, spinning up like uh, the same infrastructure on like three different zones, you need like some common way of doing that. Um, this is something that we would uh, code in our Helm charts. Like we would um, somehow parameterize uh, what we deploy in the three different clusters in some sort of consistent way. So that would be managed through code. Um, in terms of actually running it, yes, so there, um, there, there will be like, things like cross-AZ traffic to consider, um, although there are actually like, different typologies. Like, sometimes uh, you, like, you, you might want to say like, exactly what do I want to go across AZ, but right now if we're running a regional cluster, everything goes across AZ by default. And you can do the same thing if you're running free individual uh, deployments in different zonal clusters. Like, this could still be one big Kafka cluster replicating across different AZs, for example. Yeah, it's the same thing for Postgres. Like in the end, like uh, the picture looks the same whether it's regional or zonal. You still have pods running in different availability zones. Um, the traffic is still the same amount of traffic. It's just kind of like the picture you draw on top of that is going to be a bit different. Yes, um, which reminds me that maybe we should uh, do an episode on the networking layer that we have in our cluster, mm -hmm. which uh, the team owning that has, has been doing amazing work. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, I think we are good. Then thank you very much. Thanks, um, Martin and Edward. Thanks. And yeah. Yeah.